because right now you see our traditional 12 verse Shia Bichara, they have this problem that uh, they think, you know, how can I have unity with the Ahlul Sunnah? Because they are respecting and revering people Hitler and saying, and, yeah. yeah, and saying, radiallahu anhu for people who, who did these kinds of atrocities against you can't blame them. For, when someone believes that you can't, it makes, it's logical, it makes sense. That why would the Shia have unity with such kind of people? It makes sense with this narrative. But what we're saying it, is the narrative's false. <laughs> exactly. And that's why we, I want to also address the 12 are Shia scholars, you know, even up to the level of Marja'iyah. This is why they're not successful. Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Khamenei, Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Sistani. How many times they have appealed to the Shia masses? Yes. Uh, how many times have they condemned the Lady of Heaven movie? How many times have they appealed to the Shia masses that do not curse the Sahaba, do not curse yes. or insult or abuse the personalities that are considered to be sacred and revered by the Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah. But at the ground level, even in, in Khoja centers, like in places like Stanmore and in places like Dar es Salaam and other places, you, you see open cursing going on. You see open defiance. Why? Because if as a marjia and if as a scholar or resident alim, you simply come and tell the people that, look, these people, the Khulafa, the Sheikh, and this is what they did to say the Zahra. You, you, you tell them that the Kitab Sulaim narrative is true, but you should keep quiet about it. No Shia is going to accept that. Asalaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuhu. Brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us again on uh, part two of um, our. Kitab Salaim and Fatimiya series. So this um, we had a nice, amazing uh, discussion last time. Today I've brought we have our guest again as last time, uh, a Dr. Sayyid Ali Hur Kamanpuri. Uh, Allah preserve him. Sayyid, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's great to be back with you again. Back, I really appreciate Sayyid. You get making us making some more time. I appreciate. Last one was uh, it was quite a lot of heavy loading, it, but. I, I've been told that you've got some more stuff for us today. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I, thought, I, thought, I thought you had done what you had to do, but apparently you've got more. Oh yeah, there's definitely a lot more to say uh, in terms of what the scholars and muhaqqeen have had to say about uh, Kitab uh, Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali, which is the epicenter basically, or the, the foundation of this entire narrative of the incident of the door and the attack on Sayyidah Zahra sallallahu alayha that is uh, repeated and uh, parroted from the mimbar and from the pulpit during the ayyam fatimiyah that are being commemorated in these days and nights. So naturally, um, as we discussed last time, this is something that if you, you know, it, this is something that we're told and kind of it becomes memorized in our minds and it naturally adds to a lot of hate of the personalities of of the Sahaba Ikram, like host Umar and stuff. And naturally, you, you, you know, if, if you believe in this, you're going to have a very negative, uh, ne negative view and you're going to de develop, develop a aversion to hit people like host Umar and stuff. And um, we then kind of um, researched it, gave our own narrative on the issue. And today what we want to do is we want to go more deeper with, with, with the muhakkikin and mention what other Shia scholars have mentioned about this. There are, you know, kind of uh, leaders in their field of research, the leading kind of muhakkikin. So I think yesterday, last time we were included, um, we gave our own narrative on the issue. Today, what I want to do is, I want you to basically mention some of those muhakkikin and some of their views uh, on the book of Kitab Salaim. Because as you said yesterday, we just, last time, uh, sorry, not yesterday, last time when we done the video, we just showed um, uh, one other narration from, from Kitab Salaim that was, anyone who reads that narration will, probably run a mile from that book afterwards. Um, maybe in the future, we'll be able to show more narrations from that book as well to actually show, listen, the only thing you seem to know from this book is one, this Sayyid Zahar Shah martyrdom narration. Maybe you want to look at other narrations and see, do you still want to believe this book? Check it out, read it. And I would advise our, um, our Shia youth and our Shia to read Kitab Salim. Read Kitab Salim, forget about the narrative of Sayyid Zahar's martyrdom in that one couple of pages. Read the whole book. Read the whole book and see, is this something I want to believe? Is this something I'm comfortable with? And that book, like you said, then you quoted Muhakkik Atustri, who actually says that anyone who reads this will, <laughs> will realize that it's a fabrication. It was Muhakkik Atustri who said that, isn't it? Exactly. He said that you will, you will side with Ibn al-Ghadairi. There you go. If so you, he if, used as a, as a Dalil 
that just read the book. <laughs> the, 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 the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, exactly. um, um, you know, so today, say, take it away and tell us about some of the muhakkikin, other muhakkikin who have spoken about Kitab Salim and, and given us the views on this book about, you know, what kind of false and fabricated book this is. Exactly. I mean, the contents of this book, as you very rightly pointed out, speak for themselves. And unfortunately, uh, because <clears throat> many of the Zakirin and the Ahlul Mimbar, the people who sit on the pulpit, don't have a tendency to always reference uh, what they present, people don't realize, but a lot of these popular narratives that have penetrated the 12 Rashia mind and which plague the minds of Shia youth are actually based in this book. Uh, so, for example, even Tahrif al-Qur'an, for example, Kitab Sulaim is uh, one of the earliest uh, books that actually sets the foundation, lays the foundation for claiming that uh, the actual Qur'an, which Allah revealed on the Holy Prophet ﷺ, billah, is not what has reached us today. This narrative is there in Kitab Sulaim because what Kitab Sulaim claims is that Amir al-Mu'mineen compiled the Qur'an, the actual Qur'an that was revealed after the, the demise of the Holy Prophet. And he went to the Muhajirin and Ansar and he went to the Khulafa in particular, Abu Bakr and Umar, and he presented this Qur'an in, in front of them. And they rejected it, saying they don't want it because it had obviously, uh, then there are reports from Bihar and other books that, that accumulate and try to explain why that happened. Uh, they say that obviously it had... Uh, the, the Quran had condemnations of the Sahaba and the Khulafa and all of that. And so that's why they rejected Imam Ali's Quran and they instead compiled a, a, a different Quran. So this whole Tahrif narrative, it's there. And in fact, in the <laughs> Riwayah of Bihar. And, 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 no, she, and, and, and the Shia today, alhamdulillah, a lot like the majority or whatever, like a lot of the mainstream scholars and generally, they don't believe in Tahrif. Yeah, they, they don't believe in tahrif, but if you're going to... No, but that's, that's what I'm trying to say. They would, you should want to run away from this book. That's my point. You, would want to, you should want to burn this book and say, bro, we are free from this book. We're, but doing you, we're telling you, it's better you hold this view than your view. <laughs> but the problem is, if you, as you mentioned, if you do away with this book and accept that it is unreliable, then you don't, your incident of the door narrative, the whole Fatimiyah Masaib thing, that also goes out of the window. This so to, the to, to keep that narrative alive, and obviously yeah, that is the book. narrative that fuels hatred against the revered icons of the Ummah, against yeah, the Sheikhain. Just, just a um, uh, um, uh, footnote or disclaimer, disclaimer would be the right word. We are aware that they have other sources for it. So when, when we say this is the whole footbait, it's just that this is the base. We're aware of all the other narrations from other sources, but they all have problems in it. So we're not we're aware of those other sources. It's just that we know they will have problems in it, but Kitab Salim is the base. Right. We will deal with those other sources, but those, exactly. uh, those other sources don't come close to <laughs> Kitab Salim. Kitab Salim, remember, is uh, a contemporary account. It's someone who was an, who's supposed to have been alive at that time, which cannot be compared to later books, later Asani, right, yeah. which, which, are, which are written centuries later. The, because the claim about Kitab Sulaim is that it's written in the early period. It's written by Sulaim bin Qais. The claim uh, is that it's written by Sulaim bin Qais, who was a companion of Imam Ali. Salam. So he's someone who is alive at the time the incident of the door is happening, even though he doesn't witness it himself. But he's in touch with the entities whom he claims or the book claims entities who witnessed the incident of the door. Do you see? Right. So, so because of that, if you want to believe in the incident of the door narrative, and indeed a lot of people with that sectarian mindset who want to fuel hatred against, for example, the Sheikhain or the Khulafa uh, and against Sunnis and Sunnism, uh, they, will, they will want to defend Kitab Sulaim just because of this one narrative. But what they don't realize is that if you are going to defend Kitab Sulaim, Kitab Sulaim has a it's lot of problems. In the bundle package. You can't just... In a bundle package, you can't take one. It comes as a bundle. And the bundle yeah. has the Quran, disrespect of this. <laughs> yeah, all sorts of Khurafat. Imam Ali, alayhi salam, yeah, Imam Ali alayhi salam, sitting in the lap of Bibi Aisha, wal -ayyadu billah, all kinds bundle. of Khurafat are there. Bundle and, package, bundle. and you cannot do what you do with Al-Kafi. See, in Al-Kafi, you have Sahih Hadith and you have Da'if Hadith. Uh, yeah. So with Al-Kafi, the ulama, the muhaqiqeen, even you and I, 
everyone has to follow a policy of picking and choosing. No one can accept everything that's there in Al-Kafi. Yeah. Why? Because Al-Kafi, the Asani, the chains inside Al-Kafi, when Al-Kafi narrates from the Imams, the very chains have got unreliable narrators in them. So Sayyidi Sistani, Sayyid al khui and every other Shia scholar is going to say, well, I can't accept this narration because the chain is weak. I can't accept that narration. Oh yeah, but that narration I can accept. You see, but with Kitab Sulaim, you can't do that because as I showed you, even the narration in Kitab Sulaim that says that well, billah, the Holy Prophet directed Imam Ali salam to sit in the lap of uh, Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha wal Ayyadu Billah. Even that narration, the chain inside Kitab Sulaim is who? It is Abu Dhar, it is Miqdad, it is Salman. And then the, the author of Sulaim says, I went and confirmed this with Imam Ali alayhi salam. Yeah, so you see that. So, this is what so if you process. accept yeah. that Kitab Sulaim is not a forgery, it is not fabricated, Ibn al Ghabairi is wrong, okay. then you have to accept Khurafat like this as well. And this is why I said, I, I, I made a hint of this last week where can we just confirm for the viewers that Kitab Sulaim is not like these other hadith books. You don't get to check like you just, you just elaborated beautifully. You don't get to actually say, I'll accept this, I'll, I'll reject this. It's one chain and all those chains lead to major companions that the Shia, that the Shia authenticate. So you can't say, I'll take the say the Zara, Zara Shahada, but I'll reject this narrative. Why? Because there's the no, chains. No. Hey, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that because once you make it to Kitab Sulaim, you see the problem That's is it. even see the Sistani, Sayyid al khui Al-Mirza eh, Jawad al-Tabrizi, all of them, they are saying that, yes, the, the, the part of Kitab Sulaim, the tariq, the chain of Kitab Sulaim, from Sulaim to Sheikh Al-Tusi, from Sulaim to Al-Najashi, from Sulaim to Al-Kashi, the problem is in these chains. Yani the fabricators are lying over here in the lying chains. In the chain. If you are able to bypass the, the weaknesses in the chains, and if you are able to find a correct chain to Kitab Sulaim, once you enter Kitab Sulaim, there is no uh, there is no weak chain inside Kitab Sulaim because Sulaim yeah. is yeah. narrating from Imam Ali alayhi salam directly he is narrating from uh, you have to Salman, you have from to Miqdad, from Abu Dhar, from Ibn Abbas. He is narrating to... from all the trustworthy personalities. So if you make it inside, and so that's why what the, the correct explanation as to how this is happening is what yeah. Ibn al-Ghadairi yeah. said, that this book is a fabrication. This yes. is how, so fabrication, even if today I fabricate a book, I can easily say that I, I heard Salman al-Farisi saying this. Not, and or, not or, or let's say I can fabricate a book saying, because you might say, well, how? You were not there. No, I can take a personality who was there in, in Imam Ali's time. Yeah. So, for example, Ibn Abbas. I can write a whole book in the name of Ibn Abbas and then say Ibn Abbas heard from Salman, Ibn Abbas heard from Imam Ali, Ibn Abbas heard from so-and-so. So, -and -so. so okay. do you see this, this? This is what's going on in the book, is that it's a forgery. It's fabricated. And that's why you find the forgerer, the fabricator, was conscious of the fact that the content he's presenting is highly problematic. It is not transmitted by anyone else, these kinds of reports. And so what he does is he tries to invent correct chains for it, chains which no scholar in the world would be able to discredit. Yeah. I mean, when your chain is, I heard from Salman al-Farisi, the companion of the Prophet, or I heard from Abu Dhar, or I heard from Ammar ibn Yasir, or Ibn Abbas, or Imam Ali alayhi salam, can you discredit this chain? You that's, why, that's, that's why the muhakkikin mm. say the problem is below be, the, the problem is before you get to Salim. <laughs> exactly. So they're saying as or if potentially, or, or, or potentially Salim himself. There's a, that, there's a discussion on that as well. Salim is not world widely authenticated like that. Right. There's a discussion so on Salim of even even muhakkikin as you're probably going to mention now about the figure of Salim himself. So right. So, Kita, uh, Sulaim himself is a the disputed, disputed personality because he, he doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, there are not too many independent confirmations for his existence. There are a few that Ibn al-Ghadairi mentions. But first of all, his existence is doubted. But that's not such a strong position because Ibn al-Ghadairi says, no, I have seen mention of him outside Kitab Sulaim as well. But he says the issue is the narrator from him, Aban ibn, ibn Abi Ayyash. He no is the one who stands accused of fabricating this book. He invents this book and then he attributes it falsely to Sulaim bin Qais. And that's what's going to take us now, as you've mentioned, that view as well, and especially what uh, other scholars like Behbudi have mentioned. We're going to start that now where you're going to go through those muhakkikin and lay out their research about what they say. 
Right. So if we can start with Al-Alama Muhammad Baqir Al-Bahboudi, who is a specialist and expert in Ilm al-Hadith and Ilm al-Rijal. Um, those of you who have seen our previous pr presentations would have seen that we often refer to his book, uh, Sahih al-Kafi. So this is the book, uh, as you can see, Ma'arifat al-Hadith wa tarikh nashrihi wa tadweenihi wa thaqafatihi عند الشيع al-Imamiyya. Ma'arifat al-Hadith and the history of its dissemination, its uh, recording and compilation and the culture of hadith among the Shia al-Imamiyya. So this is a very good book on uh, the science of hadith authored by al-Allama al-Sheikh Muhammad al-Baqir al-Bahboudi, who is an expert and mm -hmm. specialist in ilm al-Hadith and ilm al-Rijal, uh, particularly 12 Shia hadith. Uh, in this book, he has um, a section where he places um, a heading where he discusses books which are specimens of Namudaj al mawduat al thiqat I hope you can see this. Namudaj al mawduat al thiqat This is a very important uh, section or chapter in his book where he talks about specimens of fabricated, forged texts or books that were invented by Ghulat or by other sectarian elements, and then falsely attributed to thiqat, to otherwise trustworthy and reliable entities. So the Ghulat and the Hadith inventors were conscious of the fact that if they wrote a book and then they attributed it to themselves, they would get caught because they were known liars. So what the known liars used to do is they used to write books in the names of personalities who were considered to be reliable. And then they would circulate those books in hopes that people would be fooled by the uh, author's name and they would accept all the contents of the book. It's just like today, if uh, there is some person who wants to spread lies among the Shia who are Muqallideen of Sayyidi Sistani, for example, if this lay person writes a book in his own name and then publishes it, Who's going to read it? And even if people read it, uh, the Muqallideen of Sidi Sistani would not be inclined to follow anything in it. But if, let's say, they were a crafty and clever forger or fabricator, and he were to write a book and publish it in the name of Sayyid Sistani, a lot of the Muqallideen of Sayyid Sistani would be fooled by it. They would think this is Sayyid Sistani speaking, when in reality, it is not Sayyid Sistani. So this happened a lot in, in, in Shia, 12 Shia hadith, that people invented texts or books and then they falsely attributed them to personalities who are trustworthy to fool the general public so in this Allah Muhammad Bakr al-Bahboudi gives you examples Example. of just just to say something so that could mean that potentially a whole chain could be fabricated yeah absolutely if it's inside the book it would be fabricated so if someone says at times you hear people saying oh well uh, this Sunnah Sahih and you know the Imam saying something opposite and we've got a Sahih Sunnah saying something opposite. One way is trying to reconcile. Another way is actually saying, yeah, but just because a Sunnah Sahih also, it, it doesn't mean because a Sunnah Sahih it can't be fabricated because we have another test which says compare with the Quran. Exactly. Compare with the Quran, compare with the Sunnah and compare with what is known with certainty. So for example, I already gave you the example of that Hadith, Hadith number 24 from Kitab Sulaim. Okay. Which is Aban, Narrating from Sulaim, from Salman, from Abu Dhar, from Miqdad, from Ali bin Abi Talib Islam. Ali bin Abi Talib Islam was also asked about this. Is there any problem in this chain? Some, I mean, it, 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 it seems like some mini sort of, oh, not to water, but it's like Sulaim heard from Salman, Abu Dhar, and Miqdad. That's three people he's trying to, <laughs> is branching out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, the fabricator obviously was desperate for people to believe in this hadith. So that's why he's trying to make it look like he heard it from three of the most trustworthy companions of the Prophet. Salman, mm -hmm. Al-Farisi, uh, Al-Muhammadi, Abu Dhar and Miqdad. And then he says, after hearing it from these three, I further went and asked Imam Ali yeah, to right. confirm whether what these three are narrating is true or not. And Imam Ali replied, they all said the truth. Meaning the narration that they narrated is the truth. And what was the narration? The narration we shared before, it is that Wal-Iyadu Billah, Imam Ali alayhi salam, sat on, on her the, nose. Yeah? Sat on the nose. 
not on the the nose <laughs> it's incorrect translation as i showed you from 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 lane's arabic lexicon no it, it, this is don't the do correct... that, don't do the arabic lexicon it was painful enough last time please no more that yeah was... th- th- this is the correct translation you can see hasn't your backside got yes. anything any other place to sit except my lap and, and in the arabic the word is you know what they have translated it as in the manner that an arabi a villager sits the, the way a bedouin sits um mm-hmm. i was not able to uh, show you last time the, the actual arabic word is al iqaa okay mm-hmm. let me show you what al iqaa looks like can you oh, see you, this you got you got a picture for that as well yeah yeah th- this oh, is actually, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay so okay th- this is actually um this that's is actually that's when that's when our books of fiqh that's uh, you're supposed to sit like that in salah it's written, it's written in our books exactly so what you see on uh, where you see my mouse cursor right now this is called jalsatu tawarruq this is sunnah mustahab the imams teach you to yes, sit like this sunnah yeah yeah this is jalsatu al-iftirash it's also considered to be okay what is not considered to be okay in tashahhud of salah is this do you most see of us, most of us sit like that though yeah that's not correct yeah, because most, if you go to the like if you go to our, our centers most people sit like that Yeah well well the, the according to the sunna you're not supposed to there are explicit narrations forbidding you from sitting like this um it is highly discouraged so in any case uh this is called iqaul kalb you know this is the way a dog sits this is of a dog okay yeah yeah it's the sitting of the dog because the legs are on one side and you know the back side is in between do you know what's funny they also say when you do sajda don't put your hands out straight because they also say when you do this, same way you leave, alleviate don't put it down same thing Exactly that's also uh, the way a dog would sit so the dog yeah 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 so you're because the way a dog sits is considered to be undignified you're Dignity. supposed to avoid that now the the, the narration in kitab sulaim is saying that imam ali alayhi salam because there was no place in the house like and the, and and bibi aisha was sitting behind the holy prophet the prophet gestured to imam ali can you imagine to sit behind him and the prophet knows behind him is bibi aisha but still somehow he's saying you go and sit there and imam ali al islam sits and the, the narrate the narrator is would have us believe that imam ali sat like this and on the lap of bibi aisha he, he, he sat like this well ayadu billah do you see so what kind of khurafat uh, we we're, we're dealing with what kind of nonsense in, in uh, inshallah after these lectures the shias that that listen to this they want to run away from this book the way we run away Yeah absolutely and, and don't tell me sanad sahisa baba once you get to kitab sunan yeah, 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 either yeah. you you accept this whole yeah. book is a fabrication yeah, double, you can't yeah, you can't as they say you can't have your cake and eat it yeah but you can't do like al kafi and say well let's check the chain there is no chain to check yeah, here okay salman abu dar migdad yeah because if if you consider kitab sulaim to be authentic then that means you consider aban to be trustworthy sulaim is trustworthy salman is trustworthy abu dar is trustworthy migdad is trustworthy and imam ali alayhi salam is your imam so who among here who in this chain would you find fault with and say that oh no 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 this is daif i cannot accept it so basically these kinds of narrations in kitab sulaim expose to you the fact that this fabricator who wrote this book this is what he will basically be doing throughout the book okay even when it comes to incident of the door he will be telling you he'll be fooling you with the same narrative that aban narrates from sulaim and sulaim says that i heard from ibn abbas or i heard from salman and he said that this is how the attack happened on the house you understand so mm-hmm. now now we come to what uh, al alama muhammad baqir al bahbudi has to say about this mm-hmm. yeah. and as i have been mentioning al alama muhammad baqir al bahbudi has this whole chapter in this in his book ma'rifatul hadith namudhajul mawdu'at ala thiqat fabricated texts or books or narrations that were attributed falsely to trustworthy personalities this is uh, page 352 if you come to page uh, 360 number 7 on his list of books which are falsely attributed to trustworthy personalities is kitab sulaim mm. bin qais al hilali what a surprise what a surprise surprise <laughs> what surprise. is that doing there <laughs> well it is an example it's a primary <laughs> primary example of a book that's fabricated and then attributed to a person like sulaim bin qais who the is book, the book we have from the member every year and also yeah. fabricated in their books very nice 
Yeah, yeah, basically, basically the masaib that you hear, we recited them the last time in the in the previous episode, and uh, you saw it's basically the narrative of the incident of the door and the attack on Sayyidah Fatima is coming from this book. So Al Alam Muhammad Baqir Al Bahadudi begins by quoting Ibn Al Madairi. I will not repeat because we have already covered. Covenant. Word for word, what Ibn al Madairi has said, Al Kitabu Mawdu'un La Miriyata Fihi, it's a fabrication without any doubt. I come to what Al Alama Muhammad Baqir al Bahudi says after mentioning Ibn al Ghadairi's statement. He says, Aqul, Hadha al Kitab Da'irun Sa'irun Hatta Yawm. He says, This book is in circulation until this very day. And it has been published, it is being circulated, its contents are being disseminated from the member. Exactly what I just said two seconds ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Amiraran. It has been published repeatedly. I mean, there are different editions of it. We even showed you the, uh, the edition which has been critically uh, edited by Al-Alam of Baqir al-Zajjani. Okay, and then look at what he says, what I've highlighted for you here. He says, وَفِيهِ الْأَعَاجِيب وَالْأَكَاذِيب وَالْتُرُّهَات he says, and this book, Kitab bin Sulaim, has a'ajib. It has really weird and astonishing reports in it. Wal akadib. It has manifest lies in it. Wat turhat. It has absurd, nonsensical reports in it. And then he goes on to give you reference because Ibn al-Ghadairi had given you examples of fabrications in it, yeah, which prove that this book is a forgery, such as there being 13 imams, such as Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr speaking to his father while as a, uh, still a toddler, all of those things. So then he starts giving you the references. Where exactly in Kitab Sulaim are these fabricated narrations? So he wants to give you a sense of why this book why is being been, he's it's the same thing as uh, Tustri. He's saying, let's go through the book and I'll show you why the book's fabricated. Let's read it. <laughs> yeah, and basically <laughs> we... Yeah. yeah, yeah, we've gone through those khurafat, so that's why I will not bother to read and repeat uh, those khurafat. Now we come to the important uh, admission. <clears throat> In fact, here he starts discussing, you know, all the chains to Najashi, to uh, Sheikh Tusi, all of them are weak. As we all know, Sayyid al Khui also accepts that. Sayyid al Sistani also, as per his manhaj, none of those chains is authentic. And then look at what he says after that. Um, he says, For Musallam min tahriq al nuskha wa isnadiha, and the tariq al kitab yantahi ila aban ibn abi ayyash feroz. He says, So what is accepted widely about this book is that the chain or the path of this book ends at aban bin abi ayyash feroz. He is the only one narrating it from Sulaim. Now, there is another chain uh, in which Ibrahim ibn Umar as Sanani, who is also a weak narrator, appears to be narrating from Sulaim. But actually, that chain is, is regarded as being incomplete. It's regarded as uh, being a chain in which, because Ibrahim ibn Umar as Sanani, generally speaking, people have reservations about him narrating from Sulaim bila wasita. Without, without any, there should, without, some, there should be someone in the middle, yeah. Yeah, there should be someone in the middle. Sayyid al Khui says, no, that's not necessary because Ibrahim ibn Umar al Sunani is a contemporary of Imam al Baqir alayhi salam, so that it is possible that he met Sulaim. It shouldn't be so surprising. But other scholars of Rijal, they have an issue with, with that. In any case, even Ibrahim ibn Umar al Sunani himself is da'if, as per Ibn al Ghadairi. So, Aslan, whatever. Even if you take the incomplete chain, there's no way you can authenticate it. So, Al Alam al Baqir al Bahbudi, because he accepts the authenticity of Rijal ibn al Ghadairi, like Sayyidi Sistani, yeah. he says actually there is no one narrating this book from Sulaim except for Aban ibn Abi Ayyash. And Aba Before I cut you, when you say that he, uh, Ibrahim narrated directly from Sulaim, isn't how the reason it wouldn't be one of the evidences against that being false that once you open Kitab Salaim, it mentions in the book that Salaim says, I only gave it to Aban, right? But this is our version of Kitab Salaim, yeah. So, the, the claim that is made isn't that proof that you need Aban in the chain, <laughs> yeah? You need a, you need Aban in the chain, uh, it, a, a, and basically, uh, I'm saying, what I'm saying. Yeah, how can yeah, you from Salaim direct when the book saying Aban? I understand. But what they will point out is that they will say that this is your version of Kitab Sulaim, which is saying Aban, right? Mm -hmm. 
the other version which show, for which the chain is Ibrahim ibn Umar al-Sanani. So yeah. we don't have that version. Oh, but but, have but they, yeah, yeah. But they assume that that version would have Ibrahim bin Umar al-Sanani in that place. Because but that's we why... That, we don't have that anyway, though. Yeah, we don't have that anyway. So even it if becomes, we had... It becomes, it becomes a theoretical discussion. That, but like you're saying, even, okay, what you're saying is even if we had, we still doubt it. Yeah, because Ibrahim ibn Umar al-Sanani himself He's is not... Himself. Okay, yeah, so that's yeah. a good disclaimer. To, no, that's a good disclaimer for everyone to know, actually. There exists no Kitab Salim that's reached us that hasn't come from Aban. Yeah, that, that's what Alama Muhammad Baqir al-Bahboudi is saying, because he is able to authenticate Rijal ibn al-Ghadairi. Once you're able to authenticate Rijal ibn al-Ghadairi, it becomes clear that you don't have any transmitter from uh, Sulaim except for Aban. Aban, yeah, yeah, nice. Right, okay. and who is this Aban? So Allama Muhammad Baqir al-Bahboudi continues, he says, Aban ibn Abi Ayyash Amiyun. Aban ibn Abi Ayyash is not even a Shia. He's an Ami. Okay. Ami uh, from the Sunnis. Yeah. Non-Shia, yeah. He's a non-Shia. Matruku al-Hadithi indahum. And the interesting thing is even Sunnis don't take Hadith from him. Yeah, they reject him, yeah. Yeah, they reject him. Uh, and, and what about our Shia scholars? Ba'afahu Shaykh Tusi. Shaykh Tusi regards him as weak. Yeah, Shaykh Tusi in his book of Rajal classifies yeah. him as weak. God. Classifies him as weak. So the Sunnis reject him and the Shias reject him, but the people who sit on your pulpits, they want to take his narrations about the incident of the door. Very nice. Very nice. They have to accept him because otherwise you wouldn't have your Fatimiya narrative, right? In any case, so he says, now listen to this, what he says. He says, Now Allama Muhammad Bakr al-Bahbudi is giving us his research-based specialist me. opinion. He okay. says, What I believe and maintain. After having exhaustively and comprehensively gone over the contents of this book, from head to toe, head to tail, kalimatan kalima. Al-Alam al-Bahbudi says, I have critically evaluated and assessed and analyzed this book word for word. And from cover to cover, he has read Kitab Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali. And after reading it from cover to cover, word for word, he says the conclusion that I have arrived at, أَنَّ الْكِتَابَ مَوْضُوعٌ وَضَعَهُ أَحَدُ الْغُلَاتِ عَلَى لِسَانِ سُلَيْنِ بْنِ قَيْسِ الْهِلَالِ That the book is a fabrication. It was fabricated by one of the gulat who put it on the tongue of Sulaim ibn Qais al-Hilali. وَرِوَايَةُ بْنِ أُذَيْنَةَ عَنْ أَبَانِ بْنِ أَبِي عَيَّاشِ And it is the transmission of Ibn Udayna from Aban ibn Abi Ayyash wa inna maqtara Umar ibn Udayna li annahu kana hariban min mawtinihi wa huwa al-Basra ila makhalif al-Yaman and the reason why the fabricator chose Umar ibn Udayna in the chain to link him to Aban ibn Abi Ayyash was because li annahu kana hariban min mawtinihi wa huwa al-Basra ila makhalif al-Yaman because he was uh, on the run you know for his life uh, from his uh, native town, which was Basra. He had run away to Yemen uh, because he feared Al-Mahdi Al-Abbasi. And so this, uh, he, in the Khilaf of Mahdi Al-Abbasi, which is uh, also where he died, this Zindiq, this heretic, who is the author of, the actual author of Kitab Sulaim, uh, he actually passed on a manuscript of his book and tried to circulate it in Kufa and Basra and Yemen. Uh, through the hands of the uh, foolish copyists and then people started receiving this book without any um, you know actual effort to take it from proper shuyukh they started taking it wijadatan and anywhere they find this book they, yeah, they take yeah, it yeah. and they, and they, they transmit it wow and no, but hold yeah. on. So, yeah, said uh, he called the author Zidik. Yeah, he's, I mean, obviously, a person who narrates the... Because obviously, he read it word for word, yeah? After you go through the contents of Kitab Sulaim, they are so outlandish and ridiculous and absurd. Yeah, only a Zindiq can make it up. Yeah, only a Zindiq, I mean, well, can make it There's something interesting. He actually goes beyond the Rajal Qadari research, and it looks like he's saying, it's not even Aban who fabricated this. Someone's put it on, made up a chain and put it on Sulaim. Right, so it is layered fabrication. So it's possible that, that Aban ibn Abi Ayyash, yeah, it's possible that Aban ibn Abi Ayyash fabricated it and then it fell into the hands of this, this character who then added more stuff to it and yeah. then 
attributed it to. Oh, he basically possible. lit. Or it's possible that someone fabricated it, made up the chain and put it on Salim and the Aban and they made up the whole chain. Yeah. The, 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 he's also considering that possibility. And so he says the problem with the narrators downward was that they did not attempt to actually go to Ibn Udayna himself and, uh, and read it. Because the narrators of this book, once they saw this book, they saw that it was so anti the enemies of Ahlul Bayt or those who are perceived to be enemies of Ahlul Bayt. So yeah. they thought that it was very good pro-Shia propaganda. And so they circulated it without uh, caring too much about it. Then he says, <laughs> look at these words. He says, points to a peculiar feature of this book. He says, if you look at the beginning of this book, and also throughout the course of this book, the Wadi at the Jal, the Dajjal, the master deceiver who fabricated this book, wow. tries to create a, a he tries to create a semblance of authenticity. He tries to give off authenticity vibes by repeatedly mentioning that each and every riwayah of this book, okay was presented to the Ashab and companions of the Prophet like Salman, Abu Dhar, Miqdad, Ibn Abbas. Well, Mu'af, and, uh, well, Mu'af, to, to confirm the authenticity. So you're constantly saying authentic, authentic, authentic. Yeah, and then he even goes on to say the claim about Kitab Sulaim is that Sulaim presented it, you know, even though Kitab Sulaim had statements of Imam Ali in it and accounts of Salman and Abu Zar and all of these people which don't need any corroboration. Hmm. But still, still, just to, you know, just to get additional confirmation, they say Sulaim presented his book to Imam Hassan, alayhi salam, and then he presented it to Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, and then to Imam Ali ibn al-Hussein, alayhi salam, and all of them confirmed it. And they said, everything in this is true. Who is got, saying this? got a full stamp. Yeah, who is saying this? The fabricator of this book. Fabricator. It shows you, Al-Alama Muhammad Baq al says, it shows you his insecurity complex because he knows he's selling a fabrication. Yeah, because he, and, the only way, because the mutton is so atrocious that I'm going to read, it's going to be like this. I'm going to read it. I'm going to go, and then, and then I'm going to be like, bro, this is too much. And then it's going to say, and Imam Barker, and Imam Sadiq, and Imam Ali, all of them said it's true. And I'm going to be like, okay, well, okay, fine. <laughs> I have to find if it must be true, then I must not I must not be able to comprehend how bad history is. It must have been this bad. It's like, are you sure? It's like Imam Barker, Imam Ali, they all said it. It's like, okay, <laughs> it's like emotional blackmail. Exactly. See, even in that case of this fabricated narration, obviously you wouldn't believe, no Shia would be willing no to believe, believe that, that. No believe. That, that Imam Ali, السلام, someone as noble and yes, as God-fearing as him present would this, go and sit. Present this, present this narration to the common Shia today, they'll say it goes against Isma and reject it. Yeah, absolutely. But that's why the Ghali who is inventing this book, he's very careful to say that, look, this narration of the backside, I did not, I'm not inventing it from my pocket. I have three people have narrated, three, Salman, yeah. Abu Dhar, Megdad, and then Imam Ali confirmed it. Now, exactly. if you go, against them, go against them. Exactly. Imam Ali has confirmed it. So now, as a Shia, you have to accept it. So this is why we are saying that you, if you accept this book, then you it are in... Go, and then, then, then many things go. Isma goes as well. Everything goes up. Everything that. goes, basically. Yeah, you can't even be a 12-er. You will mm -hmm. have to become a 13-er. Because you can't argue manuscript error. From the time of Najashi, all the manuscripts have this. Ibn al-Ghadairi's manuscript has this. Najashi's manuscript has this. The, the, the manuscript of the, the person that Najashi is talking about had it. Yeah, we know if there is a mistake that's expert. found in every manuscript, then it's not a mistake, my friend. Yeah, it's, and it's, also, uh, well, I don't mind becoming a 13er. We can add Imam Zaid to the list. I like Imam Zaid anyway. Well, we, we have nothing against Imam yeah. Zaid. But we, <laughs> we are addressing the 12er scholars. The Zaidis, the Zaidis will shake hands with us on it. Yeah, <laughs> but, 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 but 12er scholars ka to mazhab khatam ho jayega na? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so 
So then he says, "Tara, hada al-mughaffal al-khabith yaakhud al-hadith an lisani Aliin alayhi salam, thumma yaarid hadithahu ala al-Hasan ibn Aliin alayhi salam, kaanahu lam yathiq bi hadith Amir al-Mu'minin illa baad shahadat al-Hasan ibn Ali bi mithima qala Abu." So he says, "You see this foolish, corrupt uh, fabricator for all the ahadith, you know, which are really atrocious." He hmm. first narrates them from the t- tongue of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And then he says, I took this hadith and I presented it to Al-Hasan ibn Ali alayhi salam. Okay. As if the, the testimony of Amir al is not sufficient until Al-Hasan ibn Ali confirms it. And then again, Imam Hassan's testimony is not sufficient to confirm it. So he goes to Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. In, in, in the book itself, in Kitab Sulayn, you will see, he says, I went to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And he also confirmed it. And then he says, I went to Imam Ali ibn al-Husayn Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam and he also confirmed it and then he says and then he says Summa yahijju bayt Allah I went for Hajj and I met Abu Ja'far Muhammad ibn Ali al-Baqir and he also confirmed it so up to matlab uh, <laughs> I've seen uh, I've seen say that some Shia and some Shia scholars when I remember when I spoke to some Shia scholar about this once he said that do you know what imams and I'm I'm, I'm, I'm talking by mafhum I'm not I'm paraphrasing that do you know Kitab Salim, the authenticity of this is proven because Imam Sadiq said that every real Shia will have the book of Kitab Salim. Something like that, right? There's a narration that says that, right? Uh, he, yeah, he says th- these are the ultimate secrets of Al-Muhammad, allegedly. So I remember when I researched it, I was like, okay, so wh- where is that written? So it's like in Kitab Salim. <laughs> Lucky Bande, have you heard of something called Dor? <laughs> so, Circular logic. <laughs> what, do, what do you want? Me? I'm like, yeah, okay. So, so where did Imam Sadiq say that? He's like, that's the proof. I'm like, where is that? He's like, in Kitab Sulaiman. <laughs> so Al Alama Muhammad Bakr al Bahbudi continues. He says, Wahadihi hi asiratul kadhabin. He says, you know, this kind of insecurity that you are seeing that for different narrations, the fabricator himself tells you that this Imam confirmed and this Imam confirmed. And this. You don't see this in Al Kafi, by the way, huh? No, Al-Kafi no. has got so many authentic narrations from the Imams. Do you see the narrators saying that, yeah, then I went to this Imam, then I went to this Imam. That, Baba, one Imam says it, that's enough. No, but I think it's to do with that, that psychology that you mentioned earlier. Okay, the narration is so atrocious. Now the person's thinking, bro, this can't be true. And it's like, bro, you're going against all the Imams now. You have to believe it. <laughs> exactly. The person exactly. who made it up, like uh, Behbudi said, that guy who made it up, he was psychologically playing. Yeah, and he was insecure. See, he's saying, وَهَذِهِ هِيَ سِيرَةُ الْكَذَّابِينَ All liars, or generally speaking, most of the insecure liars, this is how they behave. Because they know uh-huh. what they're selling is lies, they have to, they're very desperate to confirm and to, to convince the people that what they're uh, selling is actually not a lie. يُرِيدُونَ بِذَلِكَ إِغْفَالَ الْمُحَدِّثِينَ السُّزَّجِ So th- this is the ploy that these liars used to fool and deceive the muhaddithin, the compilers of hadith who are suzaj, who are naive. كَمَا تَرَاهُ فِي كِتَابِ عُبَيْدِ اللَّهِ بْنِ عَلِي الْحَلْبِ وَكِتَابِ الْدِّيَاتِ لِأَبِي عَمْرِ الْمُتَطَبِّبِ He says there are other examples where you'll see this kind of deception and these kinds of desperate tactics going on. Okay. So yeah, basically, th- this is the unfiltered uh, view and opinion of Al-Allama Muhammad Baqir Al-Bahbudi. Uh, in this regard, as you can see, he has absolutely no doubt. He has gone through the entire book. He has critically reviewed and assessed and evaluated the contents of this book. And he has concluded that no right minded person who knows about the Ahlul Bayt and knows their character and knows their personalities would ever trust the kind of weird lies and, and fabrications and khurafat that this book is promoting about the Ahlul Bayt Ali Yeah, and so, see, I've, I've, I've got that here as well. I, I had the reference that basically a Sheikh Mawdbaq Bakr Babudi has mentioned that the book was a fabrication by one of the Ghulat who falsely ascribed, as, falsely ascribed it to Ibn Uyayna, uh, Abban, and then Sulaim. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's a very good, uh, stunning research, Sheikh. That, that, uh, say, that's <coughs> now a, a, new, uh, a new level of research, a new layer of kind of fabrication that before it's just simple, yeah, a bond. But actually, it gets deeper. It, it could be a bond. It could also be this. Definitely, definitely. And you will see that Kitab Sulaim is a book that uh, it wasn't just fabricated and then transmitted as it was fabricated. No. Down the line, uh, the, 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 the narrators who were transmitting it, because many of them were also Kathabi, 
if you look at the chain of uh, Kitab Sulaim, the downward chain, yani, uh, we, we talked about the upward chain, Sulaim himself, Aban bin Abi Ayyash. But if you go downward, you will see, for example, narrators like Muhammad ibn Ali as sayrafi Abu Samina, who was expelled from the city of Qum because he used to specialize in lying against Ahlul Bayt and inventing and forging narrations in their names. So as time passed, this book fell into the hands of even more liars and discredited in, 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 it's funny as time passed it, it fell into even more extremists and more liars but in the book as time passed it, get, get, it kept getting affirmed by Imam Zain Abedin, Imam Bakrim <laughs> so, <it's, Yeah. laughs> so as it's getting worse it's being affirmed more in the book <laughs> exactly because the liars are getting more and more it's, insecure it's getting more worse so you need uh, okay I think I need two Imams to affirm that no okay this is getting worse I need three Imams <laughs> It's getting worse and worse. <laughs> no, because you had people like Sayyid Fat. I mean, you, you can imagine the early Shia were not were not dumb people. Of you ha you must have had people like Sayyid Fatullah who would have said, "Wait a minute, Kitab Sulaim is claiming that Imam Ali alayhi salam was alive. He was breathing. He was healthy, and yet, uh, see the Fatima salamullahi alayha. He sent her to 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 open the door, mm -hmm. and he no, let her open the door, and he let her, you know, become be pressed between the door and the wall. How could he? Many, many, uh, to be honest, many Shia that are more research based and more uh, kind of, they don't blindly follow. A lot of critical Shia ask this question. But they obviously, because of the, because of the, the scholars and the culture, they're scared to kind of ask it. But many of them say that. It's just that yeah. they can't say openly. But then the problem is that our scholars, they play the exact same role that the liars and fabricators in this book play, which is they flash this card that no, 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 this book has been confirmed by Imam Ali and Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein and Imam Ali bin Hussein. If our people knew, and inshallah, that's the whole reason of these shows, that actually there's many of our muhakkikin, of our scholars who actually say this book's a fabrication, then it will give credence to the people that reject it and say, hold on, we have valid grounds to reject it because right now they're being forced into believing it. Like when, before, when I used to believe in it, oh, Raza is Mutawatir. I'm like, okay, I'm not comfortable. Oh, what, what book did I read about this? Uh, Sayyid um, Jafar ja Murtada Amili? Uh, Jafar Murtada Amili, yeah. I read his book on this issue. When I read his book on this issue, then days I was still double decided about this. So, you know, four, five, six years ago, I, I, was, I was doubtful on this issue. You see, so as a natural person, natural Orthodox 12, I was like, yeah, I. I'm, I'm, I don't know about this. Yeah, I might believe in the threat, but I don't know about this rest of this stuff. So when I read this book, them days I, want, I, I wasn't really uh, well-versed, or not that I'm super well-versed now, but I, was, I didn't know too much about Rajal. So when I read that book, and then he showed all the narrations from the Imams, Imam Barker said it, Imam Zain al-Abdeen said it, Imam, because my question used to be, if this happened, the Imams would have mentioned it, right? Mm. That he, in his bottom of his book, have you, you, you've read that book, of course, in it said, he basically highlights all the aqwal of the Aymar that said that this, you know, the incident of the door happened, the attack. Then I was like, okay, fine. Then what can I do? The Imam, <laughs> this is our sources. The Imam said it. Now the people say it's Mutawatir. Now later on when I research and I studied a bit more and I learned about Rajal, I was like, but none of this is Sahih. All these Asani are atrocious. I mean, how can it be Mutawatir when the only person receiving it from Sulaim is Aban ibn Abi Ayyash? But, but and you, at the very most, if you go by that faulty chain, Ibrahim ibn Umar al-San'ani, two yeah. narrators, both of them weak and discredited, narrating from one narrator. Yeah, yani, to, what is your definition yeah. of mutawatir then? Like I said, here you're talking about Kitab Salim. Sayyid Jafar Murtaza Amali mentions other sources. So when he's quoting from the Imams, he's mentioning all the other sources. Uh, you know, random Bihar, this, that. They all have different chains. So mm -hmm. let's just keep Kitab Salim for a minute. All the, even the, even all the other stuff he's quoting, I'm thinking, yeah, okay, this must be Mutawatir then. Imagine I show you Bihar said this, this said that, and you're not really specialized. Mm -hmm. You're going to, okay, so many Imams have said it. You've got so many books. Later then when you study, all those chains are atrocious. Every chain, liar. Every chain, unknown narrator. Every, every chain, chain, ghali. Every chain, someone weak. So, but then this is your scholar saying and quoting this saying it's Mutawatir. So it means, it, what does it show you? That there's no Rajal culture even amongst your scholarship. There's no Rajal culture. 
Yeah, this is what Ayatollah Sayyid Kamal al-Haider often complains about, that there are some sections of the Hawza who claim that they are Usuli, but they're actually, they still haven't recovered from the, yeah, from the hangover of Akhbarism. And unfortunately, a lot of these, um, our resident ulama and these people who sit on the mimbar, they follow that mindset. If it's mentioned in a book... Jafar Murtaza Amali is known as a muhakkik in the Imam. Yeah, but that's the problem is that he doesn't have, have that... When the muhakkik is doing this, then this, again, say it. I'm always, every time you go for the member, I'm going to go for the scholar. <laughs> every time exactly. you bring up the member, I'm going to say, muhakkik says it. Member are, member are, bichari, I feel sorry for them. They're, they're not, uh, the people on the member, the, the scholars saying this. Yeah, we, we know they, they, they're quoting stuff, but if they've got the authority from the muhakkikin saying this, so I'm going to say, bro, there's a, the problem goes, like you said, in this chain, the problems from the top, Aban Salim. Don't blame the guy at the bottom. <laughs> 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 yeah, the guy at the bottom is adding his own mirach masala. <laughs> He's adding his mirch, mirch and stuff, but the guy, the problem is coming from the top. <laughs> no, I agree. I mean, that, no, that, so, that, that, that that's, your, that's my booty covered. Who have you got next in surprise for us? I'm waiting for the next guy. Well, the, yeah, we, we can line up a long list of, uh, of scholars. Um, I think we can uh, suffice with uh, sharing, for example, Al-Allama uh, al-Sayyid Hashim Ma'roof al-Hassani, who is another well-known specialist and uh, expert in the science of hadith, particularly yeah. tw 12 Shia hadith. He has written a whole book entitled Al-Mawdu'at Fil-Athar Wal-Akhbar, Ardun Wa Dirasa. Al-Mawdu'at Fabrications. So he has written a whole book just on fabricated narratives and reports and narrations in the Athar and Akhbar in the Shi'i Hadith Corpus. Uh, he has done a presentation and a study of them. So in this book you find, uh, if you come to page uh, 183. That's 193 you uh, 193, yeah, this is because I'm okay. going by the actual page number. The actual page number is different, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, this is because there's some extra pages in this scan. Yeah. So on page 183, he starts talking about minal mawdu'at fil mathalib. He says one of the areas where a lot of fabrications happened was in the area of mathalib. Mathalib are basically reports that are uh, that talk about that talk bad about the certain vices, persons. the vices and stuff. Yeah, the vices exactly the vices, the personalities. Uh, or, you know, among the Sahaba, for example, our favorite, our, the, the Shia, the, our favorite subject. <laughs> <laughs> you could, <laughs> what you, we specialize you could, in. <laughs> yeah, you could say so. So, in his uh, in his talk about the mathalib, um, he talks about, for example, some of the some of the books that have been fabricated in this regard, or some of the texts and narrations uh, which have been uh, fabricated in this regard. Uh, let's come to the relevant portion. So he mentions a narration from Sulaim, and then this is what he says. After mentioning this narration from Sulaim, yeah, so this is on page 184. He says, this narration that I just presented, you don't even need to study or research it too much. It is sufficient aib. And it's, uh, uh, one defect is sufficient to destroy the credibility of this narration. And what is it? What is that aib? Annaha min marwiyati Sulaim ibn Qais. The fact that it has been reported by Sulaim ibn Qais in his book, the fact that it's coming to us from Kitab Sulaim, this fact in itself should be sufficient to discredit the entire narration. Yani, according to Al-Allama Asiyyid, uh, Hashim Maruf al Hassani, the very existence of a narration in Kitab Sulaim it should be considered the first proof of its being fabricated because the entire book is a fabrication. Wow. So anything found in it must immediately even, be, be pronounced a fabrication. He's not even going, he's not even going complex. He's like, oh, that's in Kitab Sulaim. Yeah, because you see, he's a very, <laughs> he's very, a very deep level muhakkak. He's a, someone who specializes this entire book. This is like a textbook. If I were to teach, a course on fabricated ahadith in 12 Shia sources, this would be the textbook I would be teaching oh, wow. oh, my wow. students from. Yeah. So he's so an how, expert. So how many? This is 348 pages. Yeah. 
It should be translated. We need to translate. This should, should be translated in different languages. This work. Definitely, definitely. Inshallah, if we can get the resources, I would love to 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 make this available in English. This book will open your eyes because it it, it not only exposes Kitab Sulaim. Is, is it similar like that scholar of Saudi, um, the one who's in jail at the moment? Ayatollah uh, Sheikh Hussein Al Radi. Uh, the Unki Joy Kitab. What's his book's name again? Um, he, yeah, he also has uh, a lot of research. It's not just one book. I mean, he has written a whole book on Ziyarat Ashura, for example. Yeah. But he also <laughs> has done a lot of research on Mawdu'at, on, on fabricated narrations. He had one about the, the, the school of Al Bayt, what happened to it. He had one that he told me about. Right, right. Al Mu'amaratul Kubra ala Madrasat Ahl al Bayt. The, the great right. conspiracy against the school of Ahl al Bayt. He's talked about how the Hulat. They fabricated narrations en masse and then they falsely attributed them to the Ahlul Bayt. So, so yeah, that the, the real scholars and muhakkikin they do exist, it's just that they're in jail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he, he, he actually Allah, 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 Allah free him, inshallah. Ameen. Ameen, Ameen. He, Ayatollah Sheikh Hussein al Radi, actually is a product of the Hawza Ilmiya of Qum and Najaf. He studied in both the Hawzat. And so he's also a, a very great scholar of Rijal, together with uh, Al Alama Sayyid Hashim Maruf Al Hassani. So you can see, Sayyid Hashim Maruf Al Hassani is saying that just the fact that the narration is found in Kitab Sulaim bin Qais no. is sufficient to discredit it. Because Sulaim ibn Qais himself is among the very mashbuhin, he's among the dodgy and dubious. Characters, you know, so many lies attributed to him that Al uh, bil Kadib is accused of uh, being a liar himself because of how many lies have been attributed to him. Although Sayyid Al Khui would, would disagree and say that no, he probably himself was not a liar, but uh, people attributed. You know, lies to him. In any case, وَقَدْ وَرَدَ فِي الْكِتَابِ الْمَنْسُوبِ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ بْنَ أَبِي بَكْرَ وَعَضَ أَبَاهِ عِنْدَ الْمَوْتِ مَا أَنَّهُ كَانَ فِي حُدُودِ السَّنَتَيْنِ مِنَ الْعُمْرِ كَمَا وَرَدَ فِيهِ أَنَّ الْأَئِمَّةَ ثَلَاثَةَ عَشَرَ إِمَامًا. He gives you other examples of Qurafat which we've already yeah, which we've already uh, discussed. So this is in his book Al Mawdu'at في الآثار والأخبار. Then you have another book. He's a specialist and expert in hadith. Yeah, what is this one? So this is called Dirasat Fil Hadithi Wal Muhaddithin by Al Alama Asid Hashim Maruf Al Hassani. This okay. is published by Darut Ta'aruf Lil Bakuat. Same scholar. In, same scholar. Yeah, it's the same scholar in Beirut, but uh, in this book uh, on Hadith, uh, he also has dealt with uh, Kitab Sulaim bin Qais Al Hilali um, here among the fabricators. He mentions Sulaim bin Qais bin Sam'an وَثَّقَهُ جَمَاعَةً وَضَعَفَهُ آخَرُونَ He says some people have declared Sulaim bin Qais himself to be trustworthy. Others have discredited him. وَدَّعَى جَمَاعَةٌ مِنَ الْمُحَدِّثِينَ There's a whole group of muhadithin who have claimed that أَنَّ الْكِتَابَ الْمَعْرُوفِ بِكِتَابِ Sulaim bin Qais مِنَ الْمَوْضُوعَاتِ He says there's a whole group of muhadithin who have mentioned that Kitab Sulaim bin Qais is among the fabricated texts. Oh. Do you know what's you know what's really painful, Said I know many Shias who go around saying that there's ittifaq on this book being reliable. Yeah, right. So <laughs> what kind of ittifaq when there are so many scholars and specialists and muhaqqeen who are warning us about it? Leave them aside. They they go around like this book, they've made it famous around, amongst the awam and well, they're starting to realize the awam, but regardless, they've made it sound like uh, that no, this book is completely they, they disgrace our own madhab, our Shia madhab. You know, the person doesn't realize they're disgracing our mother by accepting this book. They say to the to the whole world, including Sunnis, this book is reliable. Instead of saying this book is the unreliable, we reject it, we do bara from it. They say, no, no, this is it's the fuck in our school, and you're lying when you and you're 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 you're, you're it's a conspiracy against the Shia mother when you speak against this book. Exactly because so every, everything they, everything's in reverse gear. They want to keep the exaggerated account of the of the attack on Sayyid Zahra alive, and in order to do that. Kitab any Sulaim is any absolutely point. crucial. I mean, once Kitab Sulaim goes out of the picture, you don't have any account that comes to that comes close to being contemporary. The, I get it. I get it. Yeah, I get yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, so, so then what does he say after that? So he says there is a whole group of muhaddithin who have warned us that uh, and who have mentioned that the book known as Kitab Sulaim bin Qais is among the mawdu'at, among the fabrications. Mm -hmm. And they have 
spoken and written at length about his book and about his hadith. And then he mentions examples that the book contains khurafat like the imams being 13 and Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr uh, giving mawaitha to his father while he was only under two years old. So <clears throat> what you'll notice is that one of the reasons why people have taken exception uh, with this book is its promotion of the idea that there are 13 imams. You know what this shows you is that Shi'ism in the beginning, around the time of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, which is when this book is believed to have been fabricated, uh, Shi'ism, the Shi'ism of that time was not actually 12 or Shi'ism. Okay, yeah, makes sense. and so there are two narratives about how this hadith of, you know, 13 imams uh, ended up in Kitab Sulaim. One narrative is that obviously it's a, some would say, the traditionalists would say it's a manuscript error, uh, okay. but what okay. kind of manuscript error, which is found in, coming, in, keeps coming, keeps coming up, keeps coming up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's everywhere. And there is no manuscript of Kitab Sulaim, which is empty of it. Yes. So that means Sulaim, if you assume Sulaim wrote it or Aban, whoever was the original author uh, wrote it. Uh, the other narrative, which is more critical, is that no, this, this narration actually about 13 Imams was not actually even there. It was not there in the original book. After, because obviously in the time of Imam al-Baqir, all the research shows you that the Shias had no idea how many Imams there were going to be. They didn't know that the imams would end at 12. Historically, there was no concept of 12 in that time. In that time, there was absolutely no concept. Even though not, me and you are speaking quite casually, but most Shia will be like, what? But yeah, it's, it, anyone who researches it will realize that there was no concept of 12 until later. Yeah. In fact, they didn't know who the next imam would be. So How are they going to be 12? Yeah. You know, and, 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 and a stronger argument is you have, you have Shia sects like the Waqafi who stopped at the so seventh. At, at, at that moment, when they stopped, he would have said, Why are you stopping? There's about eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, five more to come, right? Yeah. <laughs> but they obviously did not know that there were going to be 12 they, months. Otherwise, that's, that's the proof. That's the, that no one said that to them. That's the reason. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's why other Shias, like Zaydis, like Fathis, like Waqifis, these are all Shia sects who don't subscribe to the 12 or Imam theory. It's because this was not common knowledge among the Shia that there would be 12 Imams. So the other narrative is that this number 12, uh, after it, so even Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Saffar, for example, in Basair al-Darajat, he died in the year 290. So you can see the, the ghaiba has right. happened already. It's ghaiba sughra. Yeah. But even as he's writing uh, his book in uh, ghaiba sughra, he makes no mention of, of uh, you know, 12 or there being 12 Imams or... So this idea of 12 is not there in the in the third century. There in, the, in that third century. It's yeah. at the beginning of the fourth century. There's a whole research paper on this that we might discuss in the future that explains to you that this whole concept of 12 it comes to you at the start of the, the, the fourth century. That's when the scholars start pushing it in, yeah. Right. So according to this historical critical narrative, the 13 Imam Hadith was quickly and hastily added. It was not part of the original that was written in the time of Imam al-Baqir It yeah. was an edition that was added by a narrator and transmitter of this book yeah. around the time of the early uh, 4th century. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened was because that guy, so the, the, there was an original text whereby the uh, prophet is telling Imam Ali that there will be imams from your progeny, but he doesn't mention a number. Okay, he doesn't okay. mention a number. He doesn't mention a number. In the fourth century, the narrator who received Kitab Sulaim bin Qais, he looked at this narration and said that the Holy Prophet is just saying there will be Imams from your progeny. Well, that does not fit with our, it's not very suitable to our 12-er Aqidah. Because by the fourth century, uh, you have the a fringe concept, group. The 12th concept is already established, or no? Yes, and there is a fringe, fringe group that has accepted it. Okay. And then this fringe group of 12ers, they also start inventing a hadith and they start interpolating the word 12 into, do you see? So when they received, when these, when this fringe group of 12ers, when they received Kitab Sulaim, they said, let's add the word 12 here as well. Okay, so how did it become 13 then? So, nah, but this is where he, he his, his mind was not present. 
he absent mindedly yeah. so because of that oh from the descendants of imam ali <laughs> yeah exactly so the, the original <laughs> hadith matlab jaldi se likh diya yeah jaldi se absent mind you see when you are fabricating you don't have presence of mind you don't ah, okay i get it i get it i get it i get it yeah so because in his time in the 4th century the buzzword was 12 12 imams 12 imams because the, the 12 were fringe group they were a fringe group at that time they were not the mainstream majority of the shias yes. but within this fringe group the word 12 had become like the watchword it was the buzzword so yeah. everywhere 12 12 12 12 so this guy he had the word 12 in his mind and as soon as he saw the prophet mentioning imams from his progeny he said let me add 12 so that it should support our fringe group but then the issue is that the holy prophet was speaking to imam ali in kitab sulaim should have fabricated he should have fabricated 11 he should have fabricated 11 but 11 was not the watchword Yeah, I get it. I get it. Sab ke muh pe on everyone's mouth, the word so, 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 so. in the fourth century was twelve, 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 twelve. So he was obsessed with the number twelve, and so he did not realize that the hadith that he was adding the number twelve to. And by the way, this is not the only hadith. Huh? I can show you around um, Al Allama Ayatullah Al Muhakkik Al Tustari. If you look at his Al Akbar Al Dakhila, he has given you a long list of narrations. in shia sources including al kafi which has 13 imams so this 13 imam is not an isolated thing yeah, in your shia sources you have get, out. but they get 13 by always saying 12 from imam ali's lineage by by that way yeah so you have a hadith in which the holy prophet is telling bibi fatima so the, okay the hadith I, i get it i get it they'll always say 12 but they'll always say from the lineage of imam ali You see the the project the the original hadith, the original fabrication had the words imams. No numbers were specified. Yes, okay, yes, before yes. the fourth century, you will okay. not find a single narration that mentions twelve imams. It just mentions imams from the the earlier fabricators did not know that there would be twelve imams. I get it. And then the okay. ones that are they just said what be imams from your lineage. That's it. Yeah, yeah. But the early fabricators were only concerned with keeping imama in the line of right. the prophet. So right. they, 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 their texts only had this much that they will be imams from the progeny of Fatima and from the progeny of Ali. In the fourth century, they weren't fabricators in the twelver sect. And they said, they, well, they, well, they, well, they, well. yeah, they said that these imams from progeny is not sufficient because they these are claiming their imam is the imam from the progeny of the prophet. I, I, actually, if you leave it like that, you're right. If you leave it like that, again, Zaidi is watching this. They're going to be like, yes, this is what we've been saying, <laughs> right? Right, and so the twelvers so realize that. The twelvers realize that, yeah. So what the twelver fabricate the the twelvers also had a fabricating division. So what they did was they said, okay, let's take all those ahadith which have mention of imams from the progeny of Ali and Fatima, but they absent-mindedly they added twelve. So the prophet in those ahadith then appears to be telling Imam Ali alayhi salam that there will be twelve imams from your progeny, and he's in another hadith he's telling Bibi Fatima that anti wa uh, yakunu itna ashara imaman min wuldiki. Oh. there will be there will be 12 imams from your progeny now if they are going to be from her progeny her progeny starts from al hasan alayhi salam not okay. from imam ali imam okay. ali is not progeny of fatima imam ali is the husband of fatima yes so whether the hadith says whether the hadith gives glad tidings to fatima of 12 ali the number the buzzword is 12 the buzzword is 12 and because of that buzzword being 12 they end up giving the fabricators end up giving 13, 12 imams to imam ali in his progeny and 12, 12 imams to bibi fatima in her progeny so the total 13. number of imams becomes 13, 13 and you have mutawatir narrations in shia sources yani you have multiple narrations you know that say 13 13 13 how by saying ali 12 imams from your progeny or fatima 12 imams from your progeny and muhaqqiq tustri mentions that in his book Oh yeah, he has collected a long list of these narrations. Yeah. Some of them with with Sahih Sanad. Shah Muhakkik Tusri, I'm telling you, that guy was that guy really was a don. <laughs> oh yeah, he was he was an expert in in Al Muhadith and Al Murijal. Definitely, no doubt about that. His wow. learning and wow. and erudition is such that it has been praised by uh, later scholars as well, including Ayatollah Jafar Subhani. Wow. Okay, this is very. Okay wow so that's now so therefore when you say 13 that's how they got the 13 and then 
okay, that's why they, they, they it, it keeps equaling 13. So it doesn't say the word 13. It just says 12 from Fatima or 12 from Ali. And if you add that up, that makes 13. Exactly. So I just wanted to clarify that this is not only Kitab Sulaim that suffers from this fabrication. Huh? Th these, this fabrication can be found in other sources as well, including Al-Kafi. Obviously, in the modern editions, they have tried to correct it. I've noticed that because I, yeah. I, I discussed with one of the, the learned and he told me that this is a, this is a manuscript error. <laughs> mm, it's uh, not a and, and the modern has been corrected in the modern issues in the modern no i can actually bring you uh, this a three volume work actually four volume work by um, ayatollah al muhaqiq al tustari called al akhbar al dakhila yeah uh, that's what thinking, yeah. yeah and the very first set of narrations he highlights in that are these 13 imam narrations and he had access to manuscripts of al kafi and the the earlier editions of al kafi so they all have 13 imams mentioned in them. And also in the narrations of Sheikh al-Saduq, you know, there, uh, there are enough narrations about 13 imams for you to, for a, a, for a deviant to start a new firqa <laughs> called the 13ers because they are narrations from the Ahlul Bayt, some of them with authentic chains because the, the fabricators were building not only texts, they were also building chains which can fool any in Rijalist. Fact, in, in fact, there's something that from memory and after this, we'll move, we'll move on because you finished the sources from uh, Hashim. You finished his sources, haven't you now? Yeah, I have. I just remember one thing that I remember there was a source Sayyid. I remember, was it, I think, Sheikh Barki in his, in his Mahasin, I think, that he mentions a source about um, the Imams being from the, you know, the descendants of Fatima or something like that. But the same narration, when it comes in al Kafi. It mentions all 12 Imams' names. Right. So, so yeah. The, al Mahasin, he's earlier. So, when he does it, remember, he's still early. So, the concept hasn't been established yet of 12. So, when he does it, he leaves it open. That narration just says they'll come from the Imam of, I don't know, I can't remember exactly, but descendants of Fatima or etc. Or descendants of Hussein, maybe. Maybe they said descendants of Hussein. That's the most. But then, when it comes in Al Kafi, all 12 names are mentioned. So you see, basically, in early Shiism, if you go back to the time of, for example, Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, that in early Shiism, you basically had what today Zaydis believe. They didn't have a specific concept that Imama will, you know, will, will be, yes. yeah, yeah, will be these 12 people. The Shia in that time just had a perception that we believe that the Imams should be from the progeny of the Prophet, from al-Hassan, from al Hussein, but they didn't have any specific uh, person in mind. Whoever would be the most qualified from the descendants of Al-Hasan Al-Hussein, -Al the Shia would rally behind him. So this is basically the Zaydi concept. The Zaydi concept, yeah. Yeah, yeah Zaydis obviously would add khuruj to that, that he should rise up against yeah, the... That, that became their, their sign, basically, yeah, I get it. Yeah, but what you see happening in the 4th century is basically the, the, 12 -er, uh, the 12 er fringe group. They are very keen on superimposing their 12-er narrative on previous narrations. So wherever they see... Amazing research on the 12th point. That was a very good point about the 12 because you clarified it doesn't, it doesn't say 13, but the logical conclusion comes to 13 because the buzzword is 12 and they never thought through when they were putting 12 in, when, the, when you put in 12 descendants of Imam Ali or descendants of Fatima, it naturally equals 13. So this actually shows you that this was actually being put in by a fabricator. Yeah, in the fourth century. Before that, you will not find any attestation. Uh, there, there is an entire research paper on early attestations to the word twelver, and you will find in the first century there that is no concept of twelve. Is, is that is that an Ethan Kohlberg one or? Right, right, yeah. We were like that, that from it, yeah. we, the the the, the imam, Again, we're going a bit off topic, but this is good for the viewers. We're called Imami Ithna Ashuri uh, Twelvers now, or Twelvers Ithna Ashuris now. But that time we were called the cut the, the what's the term, Sheikh? Say it. Cut they were called yeah, the Qat'iyya Imamiya. We were called that. Right. That was the term. The ones who stayed firm after I think Imam Reza or something like that. Right, right, right. And so, uh, Ethan Kohlberg's paper is not the only paper. Uh, th there's also a book that's been written by Sheikh Hussein Ali Al Mustafa, who's a Shia Twelver Shia scholar. He has also pointed this out that you will not find mention of Twelverism or Twelve you know, imams in Shia sources uh, before the 4th century. 
Very good, Shay. Very, very good. Yeah. It's going to be, inshallah, for the viewers, that's going to be something minor. It might shake them a little bit, but it's, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, it's, it's the start of uh, something new for them, inshallah. Right. This is also why after Imam al-Askari, salam, the, the books of the sects, you know, for example, by an nawbakhti by yeah. Sa'ad ibn yeah. Abdullah yeah. al-Ash'ari, they all mentioned that the mainstream Shia, who are the followers of Imam al-Askari, they split into 14, 15, some even take it up to 20 sects. Out of these, only one fringe minority uh, were Twelvers who believed that there was a hidden Imam or who, and, and, who had and been born. And then that the, became the majority which we are today. Yeah, but the, the majority of that time wasn't that, yeah, it was did not believe that there was a Twelfth Imam. Uh, so, the majority of that time rejected the concept of a son in Ghaybah. Yeah. Uh, they rejected the birth as well. They didn't believe they were because they had never seen anything of that sort. So they didn't have this concept that there's going to be a 12th Imam. They thought, uh, you know, there, there were groups among them who said Imam Al-Askari is the last Imam. We can't accept Jafar, his, his brother, because he doesn't seem to be a very righteous person. So Imam Al-Askari is the end of it. Yeah, so, so basically, basically if today, today the average Shia, the average Shia today, their perception is that this idea of 12 was there since the time of Rasulullah. Do you know why? Do you know if, why? Do you know why that happens here? Because what I've, what I've noticed is there's a, there's a big reason for that is the Sunnis messed us up. Ask why. <laughs> hadith of Jabir ibn Samura. Uh, hadith, <laughs> <laughs> this hadith, <laughs> I don't know what, the, obviously we have our own research on that. We believe that's a fabrication anyway that was created by Banu Umayya al -Magri. This narration, Banu, Banu, Umayya or Banu Abbas, one of them. Banu Umayya, yeah. yeah. I know because he was Jabir ibn Samura was linked to Banu Umayyah, wasn't he? Right. This narration, when the Ghaybah happened, the Shias latched onto this narration. And that's why, from a young age, because you have to understand the confirmation bias. Say it, it might like it's a perfect, it's a perfect fit. You're saying we made up 12 Imams. You're saying it wasn't there. The first thing I want to say to you as a layman, ah, oh, if it's not there, how come in Bukhari the Prophet said 12? <laughs> no, but you see. You see, yeah. even the wording of the hadith gives it away. It's, it's not a Shia. This hadith is a fabrication, but it's not a Shia fabrication. It's not a Shia the, fabrication. You see, this you will understand when you, once you understand the methodology and ideology of the different sects. The, the claim of the Shia, al Imamiya, and the Zaidiyah also was that the Imama after the Prophet must go into the Hassanid or Husaynid line. line yeah. Okay, the claim, or, the claim of the Twelvers was that it should, or the Imamiya was that it should go into the Husayni line. The claim of the proto Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah, or the vast majority, and even today the belief of the Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that it should go into Quraysh. And what do the what does the Hadith of Jabir ibn Samura say? That they will be Islam will remain strong as long as there are uh, as long as there are twelve rulers, all of them kulluhum min Quraysh, all of them from Quraysh. If the Holy Prophet wanted to identify the twelve or line Imams. The <laughs> last thing he would say is that they are from Quraysh. Quraysh would open the door to everyone. Abu Bakr is from Quraysh. Omar is from Quraysh. Osman Quraysh, is from Quraysh. Quraysh Yazid is, is from Quraysh. Quraysh is general. Your claim is specific. So why would the Prophet use a general kalam to talk about something specific? Exactly. He should. Have, he would say all of them kulluhum. Even Banu Hashim would not be enough. Banu Hashim. Because, yeah, the, because the, Abdullah bin Abbas is Banu Hashim. He's got Abbas yet standing there. Who we have yeah. <laughs> he would have to say that kulluhum min bani aw min ali ali ibn abi talib aw min ali min nasl al husayn ibn ali ibn talib something like that to make it specific so this hadith of jabir ibn samara which unfortunately today 12 verse try to use to strengthen their case this hadith is not invented for you you are using a hadith that umayyad polemicists in invented fact, to justify their rulership you are trying to use it to justify your 12 imams but fact, this hadith in fact, in fact the zaidiyah the zaidiyah cool fabrication yeah, it is a fabrication. I mean, the muhaqqiqin of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah are also beginning, beginning to see this. That this hadith is, uh, it doesn't make sense with, with, even if you look at it in terms of, because these 12 leaders, okay, Yazid is also one of them, according to their counting. You can't remove Yazid and Muawiyah. Then after that, Islam is just, you might as well just, Salaamu Alaikum. Exactly. Yeah, basically. <laughs> so, so we gave a lot of goods provided. On other issues, we gave a lot of other forward the issue. The inshallah, the viewers can kind of benefit from these other forward, right? Definitely. What's the uh, uh, you saved the last, you saved the best to last? Um, right. So, in terms of uh, the last, I wanted to present uh, uh, what uh, Professor Hossein Mudarasi has uh, gifted 
the English speaking readers. Author of crisis. Author of yeah. crisis. Author of crisis, which author can create a crisis in your life world, if you're not. Which gave the whole world a crisis. And when he was asked, what's your view? He said, I believe in orthodoxism. That one. Yeah, he said, I'm a traditional 12 Russia. My well, I'm, just gonna write, I'm just gonna write a crisis that's gonna make everyone into a crisis, and then ask, okay, so what do you believe? Yeah, I'm just a normal twelver. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's what he says in his interview that he's a traditional twelver Shia who has the same beliefs as any other. Uh, I'll, 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 try, I'll try and so and try, inshallah we can find some of this other stuff that that shows you what he <laughs> what his views are inshallah. Inshallah. I <laughs> just want to share a quick profile. People often think that uh, Professor Asayid Hussain al Mudaris al Tabatabai is simply a university academic, but this is his, uh, his page. He teaches, uh, he was a professor at Princeton University, Department of Near Eastern Studies, and uh, this is his biography written in his own words. He says, I had two completely different courses of education. I first attended the Islamic seminary at Qum. So he's basically, he has the Hausa background as well. He studied for years in Qum, where I received a complete traditional Islamic education in Arabic language and literature, Quran and Hadith, Islamic philosophy, theology and law. And then after completing his religious studies in the Hausa Ilmiya of Qum, he then pursued his secular education, which uh, ended and culminated with a PhD in Islamic law from Oxford University. And then he came to Princeton first as a visiting professor in 1983. And then he was appointed to Princeton faculty in 1986. And then he talks about his research interest, Iranian history, particularly local histories, historical documents, all of that. I will ask the admins to share the link to this page so that those who want to read more about him can do so. And these are his publications, and we are going to be quoting from this one. Tradition and survival. Tradition and survival. Um, this is a very important uh, book uh, authored by Professor Hussein Mudarasi. A lot of the times, uh, I, I, I want to recommend this book for Al-Islah viewers, because uh, many times people write to us asking us for good recommendations on Ilm al Rijal, Ilm al Hadith, uh, Shia bibliographical tradition. And so, oftentimes, even when we are presenting research, even as I've been presenting research on Kitab Sulaim bin Qais, what the viewer will be noticing is that all, all of these works are in Arabic and they are inaccessible to the reader, to the average lay reader. Uh, well, the good thing is. This book that Professor Hussein Mudarrisi Tabatabai has authored, entitled Tradition and Survival. This book, a bibliographical survey of early Shiite literature. This is the closest thing you will get in the English language to a very good book on Ilm al Rijal. A lot of the things that we share, research from Ilm al Rijal, that so and so narrator is a liar. So and so narrator is regarded as trustworthy. So and so narrator is discredited. A lot of this information, you will find it in the English language in this book. So we at Al Islah are all about empowering the public. We don't just want you to take our word for it. We're trying to empower you and equip you with resources, independent resources, which are available to you in the English language, which you can often use to cross verify or to cross check the claims that we are making. So, for example, the, the good thing about uh, Sayyid Hussein Mudaris al-Tabatawai, what he does in this book, is when he comes to the narrators, he will share with you a very quick summary of what the, what the you know, mainstream books of 12 Rashia Ilm al-Rijal have to say about that narrator. Very so by, read, yeah, by reading his entries on the different narrators, you can get a sense of what kind of narrator you're dealing with. And so if you have this book, and I'm very grateful, in our case, Al-Islah admins made this available to us. Um, and inshallah, from now on, we intend to, uh, you know, refer people more to this because this is easier to access. It's available in English and people can check. So, for example, everything that we've been saying about Kitab Sulaim, uh, there is an entry on Sulaim bin Qais and Kitab Sulaim in this book. So this is just volume one. Um, there is supposed to be a volume two, which is not yet out. Um, and uh, I, I really hope and pray that it comes out uh, because that would also be very good. It's not out yet, not even on PDF? 
No, no, not on PDF. I don't know if you if he has abandoned the idea of writing a volume two or because this book was was written way back. Um, okay. Yeah, as you can see, uh, it's Dr. written Mudarasi, in uh, 2003. Uh, it was published. Doctor Mudarasi, half is a lot. Does uh, half the lot a lot preserve him? Does great work. Um, his work, ideally, one of the works that we definitely recommend everyone read from our Shia public is his Crisis, and he's definitely a gem of a scholar, man. Definitely. Crisis and Consolidation is an amazing book the that will man. give you a, a very deep insight into the evolution and development of Shiism, and especially 12-er Shiism. And it will make you, it will bring you face-to-face uh, -face with the different trends that existed within Shiism before it all crystallized and came together in the form of 12-er 12, 12 Shiism. Dr. Modersi, who gives that kind of statement about, and uses that as kind of his... Uh, his his basis about uh, Abad bin Taghlib that when he defined Shiism that uh, Hussein Madarasi says that's kind of our version of Shiism that when people differed about the Prophet we went to Imam Ali and when people differed about Imam Ali we went to Imam Sadiq so as you exactly. can see that, that definition of Shiism is very different from what Shiism today is exactly it's the kind of Shiism that we believe in basically no, that's no, that's no, the no. earliest Shiism no, no. so this here on page uh, eighty two of this book, Tradition and Survival, uh, you will see he, he has his entry on Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali. So if we can go very quickly through what he has said here, Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali, this is the entry. So he, he follows the style of the scholars of Ilm al-Rijal. He will give you the basic information and then he'll talk about the reliability and all of those things. I can see Sulaim, he allegedly, I can see the word allegedly already. Yes, yes, because he's, he's an academic, he's very careful with any claim that he makes. So because Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali is himself a very disputed figure, he has to say allegedly, because it, we, we are not 100% certain. We don't have qat'i proof that he really existed. Okay. okay you, ha you have some reports about him, but those could easily that be, be... That should make that, 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 that auto automatically is a question mark when you're making a big case on Sayyid Zahra Shahada with Kitab Sulaim. When the, when the guy himself is, 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 is disputed, does the guy exist or not? Yeah, because I mean, normally when you have a real person like Ammar, like time, so, like when's Salman, the time, when's the last time you had a debate if Ammar existed or not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, when's the last when, time you're like Ammar bin Yasser radiallahu anhu? Yeah, there's debate. Did he exist or not? <laughs> what do you mean, bro? <laughs> no, you 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 can't have that debate in this case because Ammar bin Yasser is part of a mutawatir hadith. Wayha ibn Sumayya taqtuluhu al fiat al baghiya the hadith predicting that he would be killed by the rebellious party who would be inviting him to the fire and he would be inviting them to Jannah. This in itself is a mutawatir hadith, meaning it has been so widely transmitted that it just cannot be a lie. So when you have someone mentioned in a mutawatir hadith, uh, you can never doubt his existence. I say on top of that, on top of the mutawatir hadith, Omar's life, his parents, ex what you call existential history. Exactly. Apart from that mutawatir hadith, you've still got enough for Omar. <laughs> exactly exactly i mean okay, see when you when you exist okay like That's you are true. you are sayyid raza rizwi you are a real person because. thousands of people know you <laughs> and so for someone coming a thousand years from now it will be very easy to see that you really actually existed That's because there will be mention of you in people's diaries and people's That's books maybe That's I, I recently saw a mention of your your name in a book by a zaidi uh, author who who acknowledged your contribution and your help and guidance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Still, yeah. Salute to our brother. <laughs> so, do you see the more the more we see your name appearing in different sources and accounts and books, the more we become confident that you actually existed. But with Sulaim bin Qais, the sources that mention him, the early sources that mention him, are very few and far between. And so, this is why. Uh, some people are not even sure if he really existed because if someone is just mentioned in five, six, eight, ten narrations, then it's very easy to invent five, six, eight, ten narrations, right? So you can't completely rule out the possibility that he's an invented figure. So this is why Professor Mudarisi has to be very careful. He says, Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali, allegedly a Kufan disciple of Ali, who escaped from Kufa eastward when Hajjaj cracked down on the pro-Alid elements in Kufa. He went into hiding in the town of Nobandagan uh, Noband, in Iran's southern province of Fars, where he later died while Hajjaj, who died in 95 AH, was still in power. It is, however, obvious, 
Now listen to this. It is, however, obvious that such a person never existed. So you can see because he oh, follows no, the. Finish the sentence. Finish the sentence. I want to see that. Finish the sentence. Don't. I need to see straight away. They'll be like, "You didn't finish the sentence. Finish it. Sentence. Finish it." <laughs> it is, however, obvious that such a person never existed, and that the name is only a pen name oh, used no, no, no. used for the sole purpose of launching an anti Umayyad polemic in the troublesome later years of that dynasty. Hello, no, no. for the office. Show's finished now. That's it. Done. <laughs> yeah. there is more no wonder now, you, you see, were saving this for last no wonder you were saving this for last <laughs> so so then he gives you you see Sayyid Hussein Mudarrisi is an academic and whenever he talks about you know any figure or an, an, any narrator he immediately gives you the references on the basis of which he's giving you this conclusion so if you want to find out what kind of resources, what kind of sources Sayyid Hussein Mudarasi has drawn on to arrive at this conclusion? He gives you a bibliography of the crucial books that you will need to read in order to understand the reality of Sulaim bin Qais. So first he gives you Rijal al-Barqi and he gives you the page numbers. Then he talks about Rijal al-Kashi. He gives you the page numbers. Ibn al-Nadim's Fehrist, Ikhtisas, Ibn al-Ghadairi, Najashi, Fehrist, Rijal of Tusi. He gives you all the references. Go and read these references and then make up your own mind. It's, it's something interesting. He mentioned that Ghadari is saying basically that actually uh, a lot of the scholars were saying there's no mention of him. So Ghadari defends it by saying I've seen reports, but he's right. Ghadari does mention that the Shia scholars were saying that Salim is unknown. Yeah. So Sayyid Hussein Mudarasi buys that claim, the claim of those scholars who said that. Ibn Hadid say Look what he said. Ibn Hadid was told by a contemporary Shia scholar that this name had no matching body. And that there never was such a person. <laughs> right. <laughs> is, this our, is, this our, is this our proof for Sayyidina Zara Shahada? Allah maaf Is this your proof? <laughs> I mean, yeah, this, this is unfortunate, but we, we have to present all this, you know. This is, this is what, uh, you know, oh, a yeah. university, a respectable university academic. Hey, the stuff. Kitab Salim. Okay, so first of all, he struck, first of all, he struck the whole author. Okay, what's left? Of, let's see what, what he says about the book. Right, so you've been through this part, yeah? All the source, all of the sources named above rely for their information on the introductory note in the beginning of the book of Sulaim. Early in the 5th century, Ibn al-Ghadairi quoted Shiite scholars as saying that this Sulaim was unknown and that there was no mention of him in any text or report. Uh, two and a half centuries later, Ibn al-Hadid was told by a contemporary Shiite scholar that this name had no matching body and that there never was such a person as Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali. So this claim and this view is also there. As will be noted below, a prominent recent Shiite scholar also or two agrees with these points. Now you come to Kitab Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali. This is the oldest surviving Shiite book and one of the rare examples of works surviving from the Umayyad period. The original core of the work, which is preserved to a great extent in the current version, is definitely from the reign of Hisham bin Abdul Malik. So this is when it was actually written. Almost certainly from the final years of his reign, when the long-established Umayyad hegemony was already under threat from troubles concerning his succession. There are repeated references in the work to the 12 unjust rulers. Okay, not to be confused with the 12 Imams. No, there are repeated references in the work to the 12 unjust rulers who usurped the leadership of the Muslim community after the Prophet. So you can see, uh, even in the hadith of Jabir ibn Samara, when he's talking about 12 good rulers, he's actually referring to those whom the Shia of the time are referring to as the 12 unjust rulers. And, and in the fourth century, what Twelvers did was they took the hadith about twelve, the hadith invented to justify the rule of twelve unjust rulers, and, and they tried to the twelve just people of Al Bayt. Yeah, exactly. You can see the evolution. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, so who do we have here? First two caliphs, I mean Shaykhin, Uthman. Yeah, so first two caliphs, Usman, Muawiyah, obviously, his son Yazid, and seven members from the offspring of Al Hakam bin Abil As, the first of them being Marwan. Then he gives you the references from Kitab Sulaim where all of this is mentioned. Amen. Then he says, from among the Shiite Imams, only the first five are mentioned by name, and it is said that the Imamate will continue in the descendants of Imam of, of Muhammad bin Ali bin Al Hussein al Baqir. 
you know, here you can stop and reflect on something. If this book is really, as they claim, Imam Jafar Sadiq Ali Islam said, that it is a secret from among that the secrets. That is the evidence that that's an Umawi book. That's the evidence that it was in, in Umawi's time. Yeah, because it stops, it freezes at the time of Imam al oh, That means that's when it was written. <laughs> yeah, that's what, otherwise, otherwise, Are you, you know. There? Why are you stopping there? Yeah, no, the Imams could, because this was a secret book, yeah? So the Imams could have mentioned all the names of the 12 Imams. Right? From Imam al-Baqir until the 12th Imam, all of the names could have been mentioned. No need reason. Either you stop at Hussein, because Hussein was alive at the time of, the, of Imam Ali and the Prophet, mm. or you go all the way to the 12th. Why would you stop at Baqir? Yeah, because the fabricator who's writing this book time. Is that lived, time? Yeah, lived in the time of <laughs> Imam al-Baqir. That's my point. That's my point. <laughs> so, and he's obviously not a Zaidi, because if he was a Zaidi... Imam, exactly. That's a... <laughs> Good, yeah. good, good, good breakdown. Okay, carry on. Likewise, it is stated that the masters of paradise among the descendants of Abdul Muttalib were the Prophet, Ali, his brother Jafar, their uncle Hamza, Hassan, Hussein, Fatima, and the Mahdi. Okay. For other similar statements from the period, these statements obviously predate the formulation of the Imamite theory that considers the Imams to be more excellent than anyone other than the Prophets, including Jafar and Hamza a theory already present by early Abbasid period. The hope was that one of the offspring of Fatima, more specifically a descendant of Hussein, would overthrow the Umayyad government. The Shiites at the time were reckoned to be only 70,000. The book focuses only on Kufa, describing the situation of the Shiites there in some detail. A clear indication that the book is from that city and possibly also suggesting that Shi'ism had not yet spread beyond that region in any noticeable way. Now he talks about the contents of the book. The language of the book is eschatological, depicting some of the historical events of the first century of Islam as seen through a Shi'i perspective in the form of prophecies from the Prophet and Ali. In common with books of this nature up to our time, the prophecies have been updated in two or three stages in later periods by the insertion of words or sentences here and there. So, as you can see, the fabricator died in the time of Imam al-Baqir, most probably. But the transmitters who came after him, they updated Kitab Sulaim. Okay, so that's how you will find, for example, those of you who will be wondering, okay, but the Mahdi is mentioned. So how come the Mahdi is mentioned when there was no concept of the Mahdi in the time of Imam al-Baqir Well, the answer is because this book was updated. It was constantly updated and things were added to it by the, the, the fabricating narrators. So, yeah. So in common with books of this nature up to our time, the prophecies have been updated in two or three stages in later periods by the insertion of words or sentences here and there. Wow. There is thus a reference in two passages of the book to black banners from the East that would bring the Umayyad Caliphate to an end. So uh, obviously the person died before the Umayyad Caliphate to an, uh, came to an end, the fabricator. But people later updated it and they... You know, the black banners of the Abbasids also find mention in this book, even though it is fabricated in the time of Al-Baqir, oh, but this is... But the book's getting constantly, more fabrications are getting added. That's why... Exactly. Said, and that's why when people say, obviously from a Shi'i's mind, when he's reading this book, he's like, look, this has to be uh, from the Imams because he's talking about the future. But in reality, someone's filling in the blanks. Exactly. As time passes, the because the, and and how do we know? Because if you look at the lower chain of the, the downward chain of Kitab Sulaim, there are liars in it. Yeah. So you think those liars are just receiving Kitab Sulaim as it is and and uh, honestly passing it as it is? So they're taking this fabricated book, they're reading it, and they're saying, okay, it's got a lot of good stuff, juicy stuff that suits our agenda. But it also is missing. It has a lot of things uh, that, that need to be updated. You know, a lot of things that we have added to the Aqidah that now need to be... 1.0, this is Ghulu 1.0, we need to give it... 2.0, Ghulu 2 exactly. Yeah. So they're constantly updating the software. That's fair, fair enough, you know. Uh, everyone has a right to update software. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the reference, uh, yeah, so the reference is obviously an updating. 
the, uh, the mention of the black banners, okay, was not there in the original, obviously. But the fact that it is there today uh, is obviously a case of updating and does not necessarily point to a Hashemite Shiite sympathy. Yes. As the book has a clear, allied pro Husseinid provenance. Now, let's look at this. There is also a reference to 12 Imams from among the descendants of Ali who would succeed him. 12 Imams from the descendants of Ali. Ali is the first Imam. 12 Imams after him, 13 Imams. What issue? Same issue you discussed. He gives you the page numbers where you'll find the narrations about this. He says the relevant passage is inserted. So this reference to 12 Imams from the progeny of Ali was not there in the original book. Because remember, in the time of Imam al-Baqir no one knew that there would be 12 Imams, right? Yeah. So Sayyid Hussein Mudaris al is making it clear that the relevant passage about 12 Imams from the progeny of Imam Ali, that is this whole 13 Imam Hadith, is a later insertion. It is a passage that is inserted in a paragraph that describes how God looked at the people of the earth and selected from among them the Prophet and Ali as his chosen ones. So this is what the original book had mentioned, that Allah looked at this earth and he chose the Prophet and Imam Ali. So the, the, the hulat of the time of Imam al-Baqir, this is what they believed. But then this follows the statement about the masters of paradise noted above. The passage then continues by asserting that God then took a second glance at the earth and chose after the Prophet and Ali 12 legatees of the descendants of the Prophet to be the elect of his community in each generation. The style itself identifies this last line as a later insertion obviously added after the number of the imams was finally determined early in the 4th century. So do you see, this was added in the 4th century after the Shias had already realized that they are not going to be, the 12 Shias had realized that there are not going to be any more imams after the 12th imam. Yeah. So this was added after the 4th century, early in the 4th century rather. So this, this addition was of course a careless slip as the contributor had failed to note that it would raise the number of the Imams, which when we include Imam Ali himself to 13. Najashi uh, in his book on page 330 reports that a fourth century Shiite scholar in a book he wrote for a Zaidi patron and in order to please him, used this passage from Kitab Sulaim, okay, to argue that Zaid bin Ali, the eponym of Zaidi Shi'ism was also an Imam adding his name to the list of the Imamites, 12 Imams. This was the only report on the number of the Imams in the version of the Kitab Sulaim available to the historian Mas'udi in the early 4th century. He gives you a reference to Mas'udi's book, at tambi uh, pages, pages 198 to 9. Oh, uh, sorry, page 198 to 199. However, soon after that, when Nu'mani wrote his Kitab al ghaybah around 340, there was at least one copy of the Kitab Sulaim with many further references inserted here and there on the final number of the Imams. The sentences were now more carefully drafted to avoid the problems caused by the former passage. These appear in the printed versions of the book. He gives you the references from Kitab Sulaim. These references made the book a major source for the Imamites' argument that the 12th Imam lived in occultation. So basically, the passages that they added after the 4th century, the Twelvers started using those passages to prove that there is a 12th Imam. According to the introductory note at the beginning of the work, the book was entrusted by its original author to Aban bin Abi Ayyash, a Hadith transmitter who was then very young. Aban in turn gave the work to another transmitter two months before his death. Now look at this. The book is one written by commoners for commoners. Okay, it's not written by, if you look at the, he, this is a judgment that Sayyid Mudarasi is passing on the book on the basis of its contents. So he's saying, if you look at the book, it is written by awam, it's written by lay people. The fabricators of this book were not very scholarly, you know, specialist, expert kind of people. They were common people who wrote the Kitab Sulaim for common people. It is a display of primitive, unsophisticated beliefs among the rank and file of the Shiites of Kufa during the late Umayyad period with clear residues of the usual Kaysani exaggerations on the virtues of the house of the Prophet. Kaysani, Kaysanis are a Ghali sect 
who used to believe in the imama of Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, and they were the first people to believe in the concept of ghayba, that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya had gone into ghayba and that he would emerge before the end of time to establish the government of truth and justice. Sounds very familiar. Yeah, this is basically, they were the first people to come up with this idea that an imam from Ahlul Bayt, because Muhammad ibn Hanafiya is the son of Imam Ali alayhi salam, and his name is Muhammad. When he died, they said the same thing, that he's gone to a mountain, he's gone to Ghaybar, same stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So the people who believed this were called Kaysani. So you can also find Kaysani elements and exaggerations on the yeah. virtues of the house of the Prophet in Kitab Sulaim. It also refers to? The Umayyad positions on some of the matters discussed, many such popular, unsophisticated Shiite lines of interpretation and belief were later transformed and developed by the Shiite rationalists of the 4th and 5th centuries. So a lot of these <coughs> popular, unsophisticated um, Shia readings of history were later actually made more mainstream by Shiite rationalists of the 4th and 5th centuries, like Sheikh Mufid, Sayyid Murtada. They took these uh, unsophisticated beliefs and they turned them into sophisticated aqidah and ideology. Later Shiite scholars, therefore, had problems with the ideas expressed in the book, as well as a number of factual errors in it. Now, this can be a whole series. You know that scholar from Hausa, from the Hausa uh, that we were discussing? He has been writing a whole series on this, you know, factual yes. errors. He has, yes. And we, we mentioned one report and there's a lot more to come. Oh, yeah, there, there are many examples that he has given of uh, historical uh, errors and factual inconsistencies in, in Kitab and Sulaim. He's, and, and he quotes Mufid in his uh, thing, in his um, correction of Sheikh Saduq, that the book yeah, is yeah. unreliable and that corrupt material has been incorporated in. As you can see, early scholars like Mufid were on the board and they were like, nah, this book, we need to basically cross check it because this book has suffered corruption. Exactly. However, the text being such an old and persistently popular book among the Shiites and its chain of transmission up to the first alleged transmitter, Abad bin Abi Ayyash, being conventionally held to be strong, some Shiite scholars of the early centuries and later times thought that Aban, who was generally known as an unreliable transmitter, may have been responsible for the corrupt material. And this yeah, is the claim I mean, of... Ghadari, Ghadari thought that, yeah. Exactly. Also emphasizing, Ibn al-Ghadairi also emphasizing that the book is undoubtedly a fake and that Aban is the one suspected of the forgery. Very good. Very good. So then he gives you the references for this. Ibn Dawood also points to this. He repeats yeah. Ibn al-Ghadairi's remark. And then uh, uh, Sayyid Mudarasi mentions how a prominent recent Shiite scholar, while confirming that the book is a fake, holds that this forgery was done for a good purpose and that its maker piled up all sorts of data, some well-known, others incorrect, but in general aimed to serve a purpose. He also supports the idea that the book is late Umayyad before the number of the unjust caliphs went beyond 12, as it prophesied that the right to rule would then be restored to those entitled to it. So do you see in Kitab Sulaim, there's also a report that claims that there will only be 12 unjust caliphs, after which <coughs> the, go <coughs> the government of truth and justice will be established. But we all know that did not happen. The, Ab the Abbasid came, who was actually worse than Banu Umayyad. Exactly. So that's how you know that the prophecies of Kitab Sulaim are also fake and false. They're fabrications. Because the Prophet and Imams could not have made such a false prophecy. So he also supports this recent scholar. A prominent recent Shiite scholar also supports the idea that the book is late Umayyad before the number of the unjust caliphs went beyond 12, as it prophesied that the right to rule would then be restored to those entitled to it. Yani it would go back to the Ahlul Bayt, but it did not. This, however, never came to pass as the number of the usurpers increased and the right did not return to those legitimately entitled to it. And then he gives you the reference to the work of that prominent Shiite scholar who is Abu al-Hasan al-Sha'rani. He's a famous commentator on al-Wafi and al-Kafi. Okay. So it should thus be concluded that one of the more, one or more of the early transmitters came across this book and related it by Wijada as against Sama. So Wijada means you just get a book anywhere and you pick it up and you start transmitting mm -hmm. it as opposed to Sama. Sama means you go to the sheikh, who is the author of the book, you, you listen you out to him and you confirm the book with him. Exactly. So this book was not uh, confirmed through Sama. It was just received through Wijada. 
No, someone yeah. passed it on to someone else and they've been passing on the parcel ever, ever since. Direct hearing of the material from the author, which is Sama. Meanwhile, someone also added the story about the genesis of the book. The text is at any rate older than two months before Aban bin Abi Ayyash's death, which was in 138. Owing to the fact that a number of insertions were made in the book, there are variations among its different manuscripts, as described by Agha Buzurk. So Agha Buzurk al-Tahrani, in his book, Azariya Ayla Tasanifi Shia, in volume 2, pages 152 to 159, you can see, here, because you see, people kept on adding material to Kitab Sulaim, yeah. and there were different manuscripts. So if you added something to a later manuscript of Kitab Sulaim, you would not find it in other manuscripts because it's a later edition. And the one who added it... The edition had some extra stuff added to it. Yeah, yeah. Because if you add something to a book at the first level before it is transmitted, then that edition will get transmitted to all the recipients. But if a book has already been transmitted and it's gone to so many different people and then you take one manuscript and you add something to it, then that edition will only be found in that manuscript and then the rest of the manuscripts which are transcribed from that uh, added manuscript or that interpolated manuscript. And that's why it says, fortunately, later accretions um, uh, seem always to have been in the form of insertions and additions rather than replacements and altercation, alterations. Yeah, exactly. So instead of say, instead of changing the whole hadith, it's constantly being added. It's constantly being added. Yeah. So the old core is therefore preserved in most of the manuscripts. So the old core, for example, was Imam uh, was the Prophet telling Imam Ali that there will be imams for, from your progeny. But then there is an addition that there will be twelve imams from your progeny. Yeah, yeah I get it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and so that makes the number thirteen. But at the cost of obvious contradictions, that's the point. yeah. Which is thirteen imams is an obvious contradiction with twelve are aqidah. Some of these variations are noted in the editions of the book. A number of Najaf editions, Beirut, Qom. The one used here is the Najaf Haidariya edition. You're not, you're, you're not gonna read Jabra 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 Jufi Jabra bin Al Jufi. <laughs> we we leave that for some other time. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. That's uh, say it, man. That's uh, mind blowing research. That's uh, honestly, that's food for thought. I think, <coughs> I think after that's Kitab Sulaim R.I.P. Dead and buried. I read the Fatiha. Read the Janaza. Janaza has been read on on Kitab Sulaim. Any speaker who now recites Kitab Sulaim after this. This video is just going to get forwarded to them. The, usually they don't mention Kitab Sulaim. They don't mention their source. They just mention the Musiba. Well, no, the, sometimes the, they mention Bihar and Bihar is getting it from Kitab Sulaim. <laughs> exactly. There, there is no other primary source other than Kitab Sulaim. You don't have any other primary source. And so if Kitab Sulaim is discredited, you basically have nothing else you have. Uh, for example, the Lailul Imama, which we will deal with, inshallah, in the next episode. It's, it's, it's funny, Sayyid, uh, and um, uh, the, the famous Tajdidi uh, um, kind of, um, you could say a reform type of scholar, <coughs> sunnah Mulana Ishaq from Pakistan, Ramatullah As you probably know from the Al al Hadith, but he was very uh, learned in the Shia stuff as well, but, and very um, justice based. So he said that this one book destroyed the Shia mother. And when he was asked which book, he said Kitab Salim. <laughs> I can see what he, his meaning. I mean, it has corrupted the, as I told you, residues of what's in Kitab Sulaim can be found among, uh, you know, average 12 Shia to this very day. The average 12 traditional Shia believes in the incident of the door narrative. He believes that Bibi Fatima Salamullah Aliha miscarried Muhsin. He believes that the 12th Imam will bring the actual Quran. The, the, the foundation for this narrative, the actual Quran is with the 12th Imam. What you have is just some kind of Quran compiled by the by the caliphs, by the sheikhen. Um, and, and so all of these kinds of khurafat, where are the people your getting whole, Your whole religion destroyed to prove Sayyid Azhar al-Shahada. Your whole religion destroyed. Unfortunately. Sayyid, honestly, thank you so much for this research. It's been an amazing session. And uh, we've covered Kitab Salim. Inshallah, in the future, like you said, there's other discussions to be had and other sources that they also present on this issue. But we've covered the base of what their main kind of uh, layer is of what they deal with other sources are not as important to be honest but inshallah if, if needed we can cover those as well so thank you so much for your time I really appreciate it and for that cutting ed ed edge research thank you to the al Isla team uh, to make the resources available and giving us this time um, and Sayyid any final words you want to add? 
Um, just to say that, you know, once again, um, an appeal to, to our general public that uh, these discussions and, the, and these lectures that we're having and these exposés that we're having, um, they're not designed to offend any sensibilities or to, um, or to, or to, or to provoke any kind of uh, emotions. Uh, these are facts that we need to share with the general public because the general public is being taken for a ride by these false narratives. Remember, the incident of a door is a narrative that is used to fuel sectarian tensions. It is the, the, the foundation behind a film like The Lady of Heaven, which created so much controversy and hatred and sectarian you know, violence and unrest. So I, the, the general public needs to needs to wake up and uh, realize that, you know, yes, the, the, these narratives are there. They're mentioned in the books, but those books are not reliable. The transmission is not reliable. The narratives are not reliable. So it's high time we start telling our scholars not to pollute and contaminate our manabir and our pulpits with narrations, false and fabricated narrations that comes that come from fake and forged books like Kitab Sulaim bin Qaisar Hidali. The yeah. public needs to do something about this. Do something, and, and, and I'm just going to add to that, inshallah, we'll finish there, that actually the Shia public, mashallah, the, 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 the one really good thing about them, out of many, is that the, the Shia public actually, if you actually give them the research and show them, the, the, the Shia public just need guidance on these issues. And when you actually show them the research, mashallah, a lot of the Shia public actually listen to it and be like, we, we wasn't told this. They just need guidance like a leader or in a sense that to just actually tell them, boom, boom, boom. And when you actually show them, a lot of martial the Shia public listen. And um, they, they, they are, a lot of them are sincere in this issue. It's just that they've never been told this. So when they are, a lot of them do change and realize, wow, we were taken for a ride. It's just in the beginning, it's a bit of a shock. So Allah keep us all sincere and guide us all. And as we say, if there's any, um, as, as we say, if there's anything good in the lectures is from Allah, any mistakes are from us. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> inshallah. So the, the the hope is that eyes will be opened with these research based presentations and exposés, and the people will realize once they realize that these are lies upon the Ahlul Bayt, they should seek to distance themselves from it. And once you distance yourself from the narratives of Kitab Sulaim bin Qais, you will become a much more beautiful Shia. You will become a Shia who ha who is at peace with the rest of the Ummah. You don't, because right now you see our traditional 12 Rashi Abishara, they have this problem that uh, they think, you know, how can I have unity with the Ahlul Sunnah? Because they are respecting and revering people Kira and saying, and, yeah. yeah, and saying, Radiallahu Anhu for people who, who did these kinds of atrocities against them. Blame them for, when someone believes that you can't, it makes, it's logical, it makes sense. Why would the Shia have unity with such kind of people? It makes sense with this narrative. But what we're it, saying is the narrative's false. <laughs> exactly. And that's why we, I want to also address the 12 or Shia scholars, you know, even up to the level of Marja'iyah. This is why they're not successful. Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Khamenei, Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Sistani. How many times they have appealed to the Shia masses? Yes. Uh, how many times have they condemned the Lady of Heaven movie? How many times have they appealed to the Shia masses that do not curse the Sahaba, do not curse yes. or insult or abuse the personalities that are considered to be sacred and revered by the Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah. But at the ground level, even in, in Hoja centers, like in places like Stanmore and in places like Dar es Salaam and other places, you, you see open cursing going on. You see open defiance. Why? Because if as a marjia and if as a scholar or resident alim, you simply come and tell the people that, look, these people, the Khulafa, the Sheikhan, this is what they did to Sayyidah Zahra. You, you, you tell them that the Kitab Sulaim narrative is true, but you should keep quiet about it. No, Shia okay. is going to accept that. No, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, so if I don't curse them, who do I curse? Exactly. I mean, if some, the one that killed Sayyidah Zahra, if I don't curse him, who do I curse? Exactly. I mean, Sayyidah Zahra, the one who, if you can curse the killer of Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, then why can't you, why shouldn't you? Yeah, uh, is, you cause a you cause a tanak within the brain. Yeah. So either you see, this is the this is the part where the the traditional scholarship is scared to admit. They are scared to touch uh, Kitab Sulaim very openly and come out very forcefully against it. I mean, in their advanced level writings, they will they will admit that it is oh, unreliable yeah. and all, everything that I've presented you is actually their research. Their research. Yeah, yeah. But they will not come out as forcefully and frankly and openly against it as you and I have, unfortunately. And when and when and, one of them does. And when one of them does, i.e. Sayyid Fadullah, meaning shock. 
not even advanced research. He just like, he just like, yeah, this narrative doesn't make sense. He didn't even do all this advanced research. He's just yeah. like, yeah, I don't think this makes sense. <laughs> they cancelled him. They're, 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 when they're one of them does, off. the rest of them go against him. <laughs> exactly. So if if the Marjaiya is really seriously interested in uh, uniting the Shias on 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 showing respect and having true genuine unity and brotherhood with the Ahlul Sunnah and Jama'a, they not only need to come out and say, don't, don't curse the Sahaba and don't insult and abuse the personalities of the Ahlul Sunnah, you also need to come out and expose these researches that you've done, which actually show you that this narrative Aslan is not correct. The only incident of will, the door. Only then, will, only then will people actually take the call to unity seriously. Yeah. So, I mean, you cannot expect uh, to tell the Shia that, yes, Kitab Sulaim narrative and incident of the door, all of this happened, but you're not allowed to curse and abuse and all of that. So, Baba, if the incident of the door really happened, then tell me what is the difference between Yazid? What is the difference between Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim and the Sheikh? What, what is the difference then? He killed, they killed Sayyidah Zahra, he killed. You know, they're both killers of Ahlul Bayt. 100%. They are both Ahlul Bayt killers. So if 100%. I'm sending La'na on one of them, I know see, Abdul Rahman bin uh, Muljim in Laylatul Qadr, they are saying, Allahumma al'an qatalat amir al-mu'mineen, Allahumma al'an qatalat amir al-mu'mineen. Yazid, openly the, the Shia send La'na. The issue is, they say, why the double standards then? Why can't I can send Lana on killer of Imam Ali? I, I can send you. Lana on killer of, of, of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Then why not say the Fatima? So by if the way, you want by, to, the, by the way, by the way, so based on this reason, this is why some Shias join Yasser Habib. Exactly, because he's giving them a consistent. He's consistent. He's consistent. He's, consistent. <laughs> he is saying that he's keeping he's, it 100% consistent. <laughs> so Yasser al Habib has that Akhbari mentality. And yeah. we made it very clear. We, we were full disclosure that it is only the Usuli and critical Rijali mindset that rejects the Kitab Sulaim and says yeah, that it's a fabrication. Today, but today, the Akhbaris, the Akhbaris, for them, Kitab Sulaim is like their Bible. No, but because today's Asulis, the these Marja and all of them that are Asuli, they all they they they're promoting Sayyidah are you know Jawad Tabrizi that when he condemned Fadullah, he's not Akhbari, but it's the same Kamal Hedri problem. Today there is no Akhbari Asuli, it's just the mindset is Akhbari, but the the but I'm an Asuli, but what does that even mean anymore? It doesn't mean a lot. Right. It's Usuli so, in, in nomenclature only. Yeah, otherwise it means nothing because otherwise it's the it was Usulis who were condemning fight for the law. The Asulis didn't <laughs> to get my point. So I think Sayyid Raza, we can summarize now that there are three positions. One is the position of Yasir al Habib, who is yeah. saying, and the Shirazi group basically, who yeah. want to create fitna in the Ummah and cause sectarian discord and, and so, strife. But, they, but, they, but they're also being consistent with the narrative. Exactly. So they're offering a consistent narrative, which is that Kitab Sulaim narrative is authentic. Yeah. Number one, and because it is authentic, you should openly curse and abuse. Yeah, yeah. That's, that is that's the logic. That's a logical conclusion. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, that is one extreme. Yeah. On the other extreme, you have the traditional uh, mainstream marjaiya and our resident alims, our the people who sit, sit on the mimbar, the zakirin. Their narrative is that Kitab Sulaim, uh, we are going to authenticate it. We are going to present it from the mimbar, but you don't curse and abuse. And that's our so, form of unity. That's our form of unity. So we will narrate the fact that Bibi Fatima was... Okay, we'll take you all the way there. And then when you say, Lana, stop. Yeah, so, so they agree with the first part of Yasir al-Habib, which is that the attack happened yeah. and that Sayyidah Zahra was oppressed in this manner and she was brutally killed and her baby was murdered and all of that. But uh, So they're telling the Shia that you have to accept all of this, but then you have to suppress your reaction. You, you can't come out and curse. That you cannot do. So it's just like, you know, I deprive you of water, but then I say you're not allowed to feel thirsty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or I, I give you food with a lot of spices, but I say you're not allowed to, you know, feel that mirach in your, in your mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's the other extreme. Okay. Yeah. Or, or I throw you into the river and I say, don't get wet. This is what the traditional scholarship is trying Impossible. to do. Okay, okay, you recite the Kitab Sulaim narrative, but don't curse and abuse. Baba, how can you stop? How can you stop them from cursing and abusing? And Baba, believe, if, yeah. if, if the Kitab Sulaim narrative was authentic and it was Qat'iyu Sudur, Mawlana, there is no force in the world that could have stopped me from, from cursing and abusing. Well, Sayyid, when I believed that, I was one of those guys that we used to be like, why am I not going to curse? I was one yeah. of those guys. Obviously. <laughs> I mean, even so, so for those who, whom we know with certainty 
that they were killers of Ahlul Bayt, like Ibn Muljim, like Yazid. Don't we have the confidence to say La'anatullah Ali? We always, whenever we mention them, we will say La'anatullah Ali. <laughs> so if this was established with the same degree of certainty for, the, for Sayyida Fatima, do you think we would hesitate from cursing those killers? 100%. 100%. So now we, we've seen both the extremes. We have seen the Shirazi group. They are saying the narrative is authentic. Why is therefore, the you. Shia? Why is the real Shia view? <laughs> exactly. So first, let's deal with the extremes. The Shirazi exactly. group, Shirazi group extreme. We have seen they are saying Kitab Sulaim narrative is authentic. Therefore, you should curse and curse. You know, like a sailor. Yeah. And, and on the other hand, you have the traditional. You know, Federation, World Federation, Africa Federation, Marja'iya narrative, which is saying, no, 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 Kitab Sulaim, even though it has all these problems and everything, but still you can recite it in Fatimiyya. Okay, you can recite those Masaib in Fatimiyya, but then tell the people that you're not allowed to curse and abuse. Okay, that's okay. the other extreme. Now, what is Al Islah's proposal? Al Islah's. Yeah, Al Islam's position is simple. That in light of the research, you see, Shirazi group and Yasir al Habib, these are Akhbaris, they have no Rijali sense. Mm -hmm. They have nothing to offer in terms of Ilmur Rijal and critical Rijal. They, they are Akhbaris, they are blind Akhbaris essentially. So obviously, we cannot buy their narrative. But yes, Sayyid al Sistani, Sayyid al Khui, even Mirza Jawad al Tabrizi himself admits that uh, we don't have any proof that the Kitab Sulaim that we have in our hands today is the same Kitab Sulaim as the original Kitab Sulaim. So if we look at, uh, so we take their research and in light of their research, as we have demonstrated through these episodes, Kitab Sulaim is a fabrication. It is unreliable. Its chain of transmission is unreliable. It has liars all over the place who are constantly adding and piling up stuff to it. So because this whole narrative is based on completely unreliable and fabricated accounts, therefore, Aslan, the question of cursing and abusing doesn't arise. Because, because it's been fabricated. Because it's fabricated. So don't you see how no, our no, narrative, no, our no, narrative no, is not no, only no, consistent. No. Yeah. Our narrative is not only consistent, but it is also the narrative. It is the haq. And this haq is what is going to bring about unity. Because now when you now when we tell the Shia mm -hmm. public, mm -hmm. when we yeah. tell the Shia public that look, don't curse, don't invoke Lana, there is nothing to invoke Lana here. This, all this narrative is false. It is fabricated. So when you're saying don't do Lana on Hajj Umar, you're saying don't do Lana on Hajj Umar, not because you believe the incident happened but, and don't curse like the, like the merger position. You're saying don't curse because the event never happened. Exactly. So who's consistent? <laughs> there you go. Exactly. And, and I'm proving that the incident never happened from the research of the Maraja. From the research of the Maraja. So who's, exactly. got, the best, who's got the most consistent position? Us. Exactly. That also we brings are, about unity and it's a respectful position. Absolutely. Sayed, thank you so much for your time today. I know we've gone quite long in our recording today, so uh, admins, this, and that, yeah, <laughs> this research session had to happen. Um, uh, unfortunately, when, in these kind of sessions with these kind of research, it's hard to kind of squeeze it because there's a lot to say. And I, I like interrupting Sayed a lot as well, so that's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of my fault as well. Um, but Sayed, thank you so much. Inshallah, we will definitely see you soon in our, new, in, in our other research sessions on other topics, uh, maybe even more on this issue if, if needed. Um, and uh, thank you all the viewers for tuning in Inshallah we will see all of you soon Make sure you like and subscribe on the channel Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh